Hello and welcome to Kingdom of Context. I'm Sean. I want to thank you for joining me here tonight. We're going to have a wonderful interview with Mark Sargent of his self-titled channel, Mark Sargent, and on YouTube. And uh, we're excited to get into that. But before we do, I just want to say a big shout out and thank you to the moderators that are here tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, we don't know what to expect from the live chat tonight, and what type of uh, <clears throat> what type of fun conversation that this uh, this interview tonight will bring. So, just moderators, as always, we want to lovingly encourage you. Please do not um, permanently ban anyone, but just put them on a timeout or put them on a, a mute if you have to. If they get out of hand, um, not just if they're disagreeing with what we think and talk about on this channel, it's okay if they disagree. But if they get contentious, if they start name calling, accusing people, if they start, you know, um, acting a fool, basically, then you can put them on a mute. But hopefully their heart will change. And if they're not perma banned, then they'll come back next time and act better. So thank you so much, moderators, for abiding by that that general principle and standard. And everyone else that's here watching, both on Lighthouse and on YouTube. Big shout out to everyone that's here. Uh, we've got uh, we've already got a whole crew of people in the live chat on and Lighthouse as well. So you guys are awesome. And uh, Ms. Marsha, Ms. Leonard's over there. And as a quick uh, reminder, tomorrow is the day that I'm doing the giveaway. So tomorrow, I'm actually going to be doing the um, the selection, the drawing, the drawing, if you will, for the $500 Home Depot gift card for Father's Day. So how you enter that is if you join our channel on Lighthouse or if you drop a light sticker on Lighthouse. That's uh, all, all those people because Lighthouse actually knows from your profile. It, it shows me who you are that dropped the light sticker and joined. YouTube doesn't do that. So um, that's why we're encouraging folks to switch over there and your support goes much further over there. They don't take 30 percent like Lighthouse excuse me, like uh, YouTube, Lighthouse doesn't take 30%. So um, it, the, your help and your support goes much further. So we appreciate you guys. So tomorrow, all the people that have been uh, joining and supporting us over there or dropping a light sticker uh, for support, we'll do the drawing for the gift card. So you guys, um, we're super appreciated. You know, super appreciated. Thank you so much. All right. So without further ado, I would like to bring on to the program, Flat Earth Advocate and Recruiter, Mark Sargent. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Welcome. thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. So uh, I've, I've watched you for years. Um, I was, uh, I think I remember being, I watched a Rob Skiba video. I was in the gym. It was 2015. Yep. I watched a Rob Skiba video yeah. and he mentioned that the word firmament might have a definition to it. And so that was before all the censorship on YouTube. So I immediately went to the YouTube search bar. Well, after I, finished laughing at the thought of course and then about an hour later I, I came to my senses and said well, wait a minute words do have definitions right and so then i went to youtube search bar i typed in f-l-a-t-e-a-t-r-t-h and then these wonderful videos of clues popped up and uh, i think i watched the second one first and then i had to go back and watch them all in sequential order yeah so would you like to, you are the, the author of the flat earth clues uh, yep. mark Sargent, and i would just like uh, i want to thank you for joining me tonight and would you like to just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Where you're going? Uh, it, it's been an amazing ride so far. Uh, my name is Mark Sargent. I got into Flat Earth. I started looking at it in 2014, made my very first video ever uh, in 2015, the beginning of 2015, put it out there as a cry for help because I couldn't prove the globe in a court of law anymore and waited for the other shoe to drop, waited for academics to come on, you know, hit me with a ton of bricks. And they never did. And I mean, this thing just kept steamrolling and expanding and expanding. Uh, and now here we are nine years later, where, um, you know, three books, a couple documentaries, a third one, if the French one ever comes out, I apparently is going to get a, get a link for that pretty soon. Oh, I, I lost count on how many interviews, even though David Weiss has done probably triple the amount I have. And uh, yeah, it's been an amazing ride so far but yeah i i am the flat earth recruiter let, let me let me start with that which is you may if you're into flat earth chances are a lot of what you learned links back to what i created in the, the beginning of 2015. the only people that did stuff before me uh, in any amount would have been eric de bay out of thailand and matt boyland out of canada originally he's from montreal canada i have no idea where he is now so there you go. Yeah, he probably wanted to just uh, not be harassed anymore. So he probably got out the game. Who, but, Matt um, Boylan? Yeah, Matt Boylan. Oh. Yeah. Oh, you never know. You never know with Matt. He was an interesting guy to watch, though. Every producer, so many producers. Did you ever see Behind the Curve, the, the Netflix documentary? I did. Yeah. The, um, the, that, that was that, that, there was no, there was very little fiction in that. 
meaning Matt Boylan was really that aloof artist type of guy. Mm -hmm. You know, producers like, oh, how do we get a hold of Matt Boylan? Can you get a hold of him? I'm like, no, no, he doesn't want to talk to me. Either. And, and tell, him, so, tell him we're filming in an empty warehouse with one wooden chair. Right. And he'll right. show up. He was like, he was the, he, if a flat earther was our version of, it uh, was our version of Andy Warhol. I was, yeah, I was about to say, yeah. Basically, like, he was that guy. And so by the time, the, the ironic thing was, by the time he got into it, you know, when he, when he says, okay, I'll talk to media now. One, the media didn't even want to talk to him because we were already out, of, you know, out of the gate. And the other part was, who knew he, he couldn't do an interview to save his life. He, for whatever reason, he, I mean, that, that part where he's constantly looking over his shoulder, swearing that, you know, the government's looking and listening to everything, which they do, but he was, he played, we thought that paranoid thing was just an act. It's not an act. He, he, he cut off interviews because he swore there was, there was CIA viruses, you know, jumping around his computer. But anyway. Yeah. And that's, there's been a lot of uh, folks that have t tried to start talking about this topic and they started yeah. in getting seeing the uh the pushback the censorship um and then they they decided not to talk about it anymore right and so yeah. there's you know to, to respect to them and their family and, and what choices they've made sure. um we actually feel like uh th there's an easy workaround from our perspective because we i'm a christian i believe jesus christ is the son of god i believe there is a creator uh the almighty and so when I read the Bible and I see, you know, he actually described an enclosed system, um, then I just started talking about biblical cosmology from that point forward. Right. Instead right. of and the, you know, the extremely uh, condemned two words of flat and earth. Right. And if it yeah. wasn't for the late Rob Skiba, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have even known what biblical cosmology, you know, that that was really a term right. to latch onto. He was the guy, you know, I turned him back in, in 2015. Well, it makes it sound like I'm a vampire. Um, but I, I did, I turned him on, on the flat earth in 2015, you know, the story very well, you know, where he got a canary cry radio and listened to the, the thing that I was doing with him. And he was one of the first people to reach out to me. And, uh, we were friends all the way to the end, uh, where he said, yeah, it's a flat earth book. He goes, he's absolutely flat earth. He goes, not only, and not only that he dedicated, you know, the website, which is still out there, testing the globe.com, which is absolutely phenomenal. You know, anyone that's in a biblical cosmology or, or doesn't believe that the Bible is a flat earth book, go to, you know, to testingtheglobe.com. But then he followed up and saying, oh, yeah, Zen Garcia, that's mm -hmm. changed his life. You know, Zen Garcia, who went to, to some of our conferences and Zen, Zen's big thing was the Book of Enoch. And he because he was trying to figure out stuff with the Book of Enoch. It's, you know, as you know, the Book of Enoch is not the easiest read in the world for the novice. Right. Yeah. I actually wrote a commentary on it. Yep. Yep. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you. <laughs> and, and Zen called up uh, Rob right away and said, yeah, he goes, this answers so many questions that I had. This fills in so many gaps. And for him, th and that's when he, Zen started writing furiously about uh, uh, the, the, the book of Enoch again, because again, it, the, unless you look at it from a flat earth or biblical cosmology perspective, the book of Enoch is it, there's things that don't make sense. But once you get into our mindset, oh yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if it's in a firmament enclosed model, yeah. then the book of Enoch makes sense. Because in chapter 72, it talks about the, the, the way that uh, Enoch was being shown the creation in different parts of the creation. Right. And it says that there was 12 portals three on each, I guess, if, if I could just use this term, three sure. in each cardinal direction on the exterior of the firmament. And those actually are like huge gates that are open to let in certain yeah. winds to create weather patterns. Yeah. And the average person doesn't realize that um, all weather stations come, all weather prediction patterns come from a Antarctica. Ooh. I, can, hell, I didn't know that. Yeah, we did a thing. I, I actually mean another buddy, West Blaze. We do a show called uh, Uncommon Ground, and it's all yeah. about cosmology. And uh, in our first season, we did, I think it was episode four, we did a show in Antarctica. And I, there's a, I, I showcase a documentary about a Russian uh, weather station in Antarctica, and they, they're talking about it, how the average person doesn't realize that all weather predictions come from Antarctica. That's where everything yeah. They're putting up daily. They put up weather balloons daily. And right. They, I knew that part. Well, special grease they put on them because of the low air pressure and everything. And, and so they put them up daily uh, in order to test the weather. And then that becomes the weather patterns that gets reported back to all the major outlets. Nice. So that makes perfect sense with what the book of Enoch claims. Yeah. And, that, and, and again, the average person, when you look at the book of Enoch, like you were just talking about where they talk about physical portals and, and mechanical, mechanical devices and, and mechanisms yeah. that are up there. And, 
the average person's like, well, yeah, but it can't be actual mechanicals because that makes the world, you know, seem like it's like a, a, a giant building, you know, a giant, uh, you know, structure. And then when you start getting into our stuff, you're like, oh, hey, <laughs> yeah, it does, does kind of sound like that, doesn't it? You know, yeah, kind of like backstage. You know, when when you're be if you if you knew if you've done any stage production, when you go back behind like a like a live stage play, it's all gears and pulleys and ropes and all this stuff. When I first went when I got into this and got into the Book of Enoch, I'm going, Enoch is the, the behind the scenes. It's behind the curtain. That mm -hmm. that's all it is, and which is why I'm sure it wasn't canonized. Well, <laughs> that's that's the crazy history about that particular book is that. Um, the first century, so it was considered sacred scripture until the first century AD, and there was a specific uh, rabbi of Judaism, and I say that specifically because there's a difference between just Jews of the first century versus, there became a split, if I could put it like this, between um, people in Judea that started to believe in Jesus Christ versus those who wanted to not believe in Jesus Christ and then were a part of, stayed with traditional Judaism at the time. Right. And so the, the rabbis, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the, the religious controlling class, um, they want, they didn't like people believing in Christ. So they were kicking them out of the synagogues, uh, which is where the scriptures were read. And then and at the, towards the later, you know, 75% way into the first century AD, specifically a, a rabbi named Rabbi Akiva, he had the most authority and he's the one that decided we're going to remove some books from what we consider sacred scriptures and, and yeah. discourage people from reading them. And one of those was the book of Enoch. There you go. Yeah. Because it prophesies the first and second coming of the Messiah. Yeah. And they, and it was fulfilling all these prophecies and, and they didn't want people believing in them. Yeah. And just like today, just like corrupt religious leaders today, they threaten people's salvation, you know, like as if they have the power to 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 do that anyway. Right, right. Yeah. Or or hang on to one verse like it has veto power. And and for right. those out there in your audience, and I'm sure there are many of them that that, that say, oh, you know, the Bible's got to mention, you know, that it's a sphere, a globe, or a ball. It's like no, it mentions Isaiah forty twenty two, one verse that he who sitteth on the upon the circle of the earth. That's and right. as you know, the circle is not the same word as ball or globe or sphere, especially in Hebrew. All right. And and I have I have talked to pastors that hold on to it with their fingernails, that verse, like it has veto power over, I don't know, Genesis when it talks about the the firmament. And I know you know one verse isn't supposed to hold sway over the other, but it's like, but but the reason they're holding on to it is fear. The 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 fear of going to your congregation and saying, Oh, hey, by the way, we're gonna roll this back a bit. And we're going to go with, with the old school thing. And again, if you if anyone's in doubt, you can Google, and I won't pull it up on screen, but you you know what it is. I mean, you go into, not biblical cosmology, but type in, well, you could type in that too, but type in ancient cosmology mm -hmm. and click on images in any yeah. search engine and see what happens. It, everybody drew the same thing. They drew yeah. some sort of snow globe building structure. Yep, with uh, multiple layers. With multiple and, layers, uh, and the biblical yeah, I, cosmology thing varies only in that you know there's a the substrata, you know the lower, the lower yeah. areas. That's yeah. Yeah, there's we we found we found quotes from uh, first century uh, and second century quote unquote early church fathers that are talking about the firmament, and they they say, yeah, it has seven layers or seven levels of firmament. Yeah. At Very the good. top is the Creator, the Almighty, and then we're down here on. What was considered the the last layer encompassed by the the last firmament that was created on day two of genesis sure. and so that's where um i interview pastors on my channel and try to bring this up to them and they just you know start knee jerking like crazy right because yeah. it's yeah. hard for them to to admit that their their congregants might kick them out of the church right right yeah, yeah. you i mean the congregation peer pressure it doesn't matter where you go peer pressure is still the same it doesn't matter how you slice and how you label it. And the congregation is huge amounts of peer pressure, especially if yeah. you're that guy on stage and it's usually just you. I mean, occasionally you got some backup singers and, and, and backup speakers and stuff like that, but you don't want to, you know, turn against them or, you know, that fear of the mob, you know, them all of a sudden, you know, you feel that wave, you know, any, anybody who's on stage in any capacity will tell you it's the same thing. And, and pastors are not immune to it by any stretch. Yeah, they're not, especially because many of them were ordained by their association. So if they're like in a Lutheran, Presbyterian, Baptist, yeah. and if that and if that uh, you know elder council decides that you're preaching something against their their orthodoxy, yeah. they, you you lost your job. They'll yeah. they'll kick you out. So it's there's yeah. peer pressure both from the community as well as from their families, you know, to keep their job and their income. Yeah. And it it so for the few pastors that have come on, if you're watching this right now and you've seen that you uh, that I have, you know, you did 
uh, openly talk about this with me. You didn't laugh at it and mock it. And yeah. some of you even have realized it's the truth now and are actually declaring it. Uh, big kudos to you because I know the risk you're taking with your personal lives. Yep. So big kudos to you guys. Um, yep. Yep. Mark, tell us a little bit about before we go into like really uh, modern events as far as like how the culture is reacting to this topic and everything. Would you mind mm -hmm. sharing with my audience a little bit kind of about where you came from, where you grew up, you know, and what got sure. you here? I was born on a rural island up north in the northwest of the country, north of Seattle, just just <clears throat> just south of the San Juans called Whidbey, W H I D B E Y, uh, a type of place where it was tough to get in trouble, uh, meaning short short of throwing rocks at cop cars, it was tough to get in in trouble. Um, so I was very innocent, very sheltered, very, very naive. Uh, I only really only thought there was one religion. I was raised born again, Christian, uh, went to Christian missionary and Alliance church. That was CMA out of Langley, Washington. And that was during the eighties. I'm a little bit older. So that was a, that was that one of that, those Hey, heyday decades for Christianity where, you know, it was, a, it was kind of a cool thing. We had church wasn't just a Sunday thing. We had youth group, we had um, Saturday things. We, you know, I went to um, vacation Bible school, you know, summer camps. I went to uh, Camp Malibu up in Canada. If you've ever heard of that, that was a really fun Christian camp and didn't, you know, just kind of follow the rules. I didn't think there was a conspiracy. I didn't know what the word conspiracy was <laughs> until yeah. I got out of, got off the island, went to, um, uh, went to college and I remember my very first conspiracy, and I know we have to be careful about what we talk about in some places. Um, but I, but I watched the uh, the Oliver Stone movie JFK, and uh, in the in the early nineties in the theater because there was no internet, and I was like, wow, you know, packed house. Everyone was like, everyone that came out of that I remember was was visibly upset because he it was, it was that was his masterpiece. You know, he mm -hmm. interspliced everything so well that people were all in on this thing. Um, was then, it three hours long? Yeah, it was over three hours long, and yeah. uh, and you know, all star cast. Heck, I think the actors did it for free, you know, because most most actors, you know, they love the whole they they love the idea of JFK. JFK was no saint, right? By any right. stretch, but but as far as presidents go, he was one of the most popular presidents of, of all time. You know, not not legendary like Lincoln or Washington or Jefferson and those guys, but modern day presidents, he was way up there. Well, you know, he vowed to do this thing and the other. <laughs> Yes, that always yes. cracks me up about that speech. We vow to go to the moon and to yeah. do this and thing this and the other, and do like, the what? other thing. Not what, because what it's easy, <laughs> but because it's hard. In that uh, thick Boston ass accent he had, Massachusetts accent. Yeah. Um. But anyway, so but, but yeah, my um, you know, I I had I have one sister. Um. Uh. Standard. You know, really, I don't know. As far as growing up, sorry, really quick. High school, I was kind of a click jumper. Meaning I was athletic, but I was pretty smart. Uh, but I also was eccentric. So, and I'm not going to go into the fireworks thing. You kind of, you know that one. Anyone else check? There's videos on that. Long, long story short, uh, Mark almost got in trouble with the feds because he started making his own fireworks. That's almost got in trouble. No, no, oh, no, okay. no. Well, I, I mean, you're, not, really... you're not still in jail. So, no, 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 no. I never did yeah. time. And, and that's right. because the laws of you guys probably don't know this, but illegal fireworks, you know, cherry bombs and that sort of thing, they were yeah. legal all the way up until Kennedy's era. And then they part of the Child Protection, Protection Act. And I agree with it. You know, for, for various reasons, you don't want kids blowing their fingers off. Yeah. So they made it illegal. Well, unfortunately for me, I came along 20 years later and uh, the, the Native American reservations want, still were selling them because they're exempt from a lot of things, but they still had to sell it underneath the table and they're looking for suppliers. And so I used to, I was pretty good at chemistry and I used <laughs> to make it for them and I got in trouble. Uh, but yeah, so on a much smaller scale, me and some neighbors in the neighborhood when I was like 12 or 13, we got, you know, a whole bunch of packs of black cats and just meticulously sure. got the gunpowder out of them and then tried to make our own larger incendiary device. But by the, just by the way, technology. just, just so you guys know, it's not, I mean, yes, you can use gunpowder if you want, but the stuff that's in firecrackers is actually just flash powder. And if you're wondering what yeah. flash powder is, it's literally what you think, which is it is the you, we've seen it in movies and television, you know, going back years, which was to take flash photography back in the day. You needed a really, really, really fast burning powder. So you filled up a tray with this powder. You hopefully didn't use too much. And you that the poof. Right. And, you know, the, the running gag where if you use too much, everyone got black faced or, you know, burned up. And, and it was it was awful. So. 
um, if you can find it, though, it burns so fast that it would burst any container that was in. And that is the, the definition of firecrackers. It's not like Centex or C4 or anything like that with, with a really, really fast um, feet per second. But it's but it's very, you know, still very loud. It's 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 fireworks, right? It's it's showtime. It's stuff they use. They use flash powder in stage productions all day long. Anyway, mm -hmm. I got in trouble for it. Changed my life, which was, you know, I got in trouble for it just as I was turning 21. Personally, I think they just waited until I turned 21 so they could throw the book at me. Um, and then uh, part of my community service was to teach kids. I was a computer, a computer aide at a, at a middle school. Because I, I knew I grew up in a teacher's lounge. My I there's tons of teachers in my family. I'm for well, probably one of the few people ever that was did his community service at a school, right? Wow. There wasn't janitorial yeah. work. Yeah. And be, and in my spare time, I played a lot of video games, played computer pinball, won a computer pinball tournament. Um, the company that was in Boulder, Colorado that published it hired me to be a ringer. And so I went out to, to Boulder, Colorado, and I lived there for 20 years. Uh, from 95 until 2015, almost to the day, I think it was just a little over 20 years. And during that time, uh, I, I never got married or had kids, so I had a lot of free time on my hands. So I went down just about every internet rabbit hole you could think of when the internet was new, right? When you could finish the freaking internet. And so <laughs> I, I was eased into it, you know, everything from 9 11 to Bigfoot to Loch Ness Monster to the moon landing and so on and so on. all the big major conspiracies, Pearl Harbor. And then all the smaller conspiracies, you know, any any tragic mass incidents that happened in various places. And that's when I looked into, uh, you know, I, I wasn't getting any younger. So when I was in my mid 40s, I decided, you know what, flat earth, why not? Right. Kind of like what, what we were doing during the pandemic, kind of like now I've watched just about everything on Netflix. I never said I was. In fact, I'm, I'm only on season three of the blacklist. Never watched the blacklist. I'm now watching the freaking blacklist. Have you, all seen, 15 have you seen dark? The what? dark is that that german one mm -hmm. yeah oh yeah i saw it yeah 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 um yeah, yeah but there, again there's... the fact that i'm watching stuff that's dubbed or subtitled is amazing right, right? um so when i looked at flat earth thought for sure because you know i i have an opinion now again because i had so much time on my hands i, I have an opinion on just about every conspiracy there is you can ask me anything you want i may like i like some i don't like others was JFK shot by a lone gunman that was then in turn shot by a lone gun? Probably not. That's lightning striking lightning. Highly unlikely, right? Do I think that Elvis is alive and is uh, having a, a relationship with Bigfoot? No, probably not. <laughs> no. But yeah. And so Flat Earth, which was kind of in between those two, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll look at this thing. And uh, I hated it. It's like, there's, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way. I mean, Flat Earth is too, we, again, it's the only thing we debunk to children which should say something. And I looked at it over a weekend, thought I could I could knock it out in a weekend. Nope, turned into a week, turned into months, turned into nine months. And that's when I decided I was going to you know, make a, a series of videos because the, the internet as a hive mind is very, very intelligent. People, individuals, not so much. But as a hive mind, everybody has a little piece of the information that, that something's missed. And I said, okay, tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me where I screwed this up. Nobody ever did. In fact, the academics never ever called me. In fact, it was subject matter experts, all the people from military and air traffic controllers and pilots, everybody except for aerospace, for a good reason, contacted me and said, yeah, it's not that nuts. Here's why. And they would give me these little things. I was like, what? You mean I'm right? Are you serious? I, for, for the first six months, I honestly thought that that I could I was going to get shut down and I'd get back to playing video games. Nope. That, that, you, that, would, that you would eventually interview somebody that actually gave you the missing puzzle piece and and debunk debunk the whole idea, but that yeah, never yeah, happened. Yeah, somebody, yeah, yeah, some some you some guy with a master's in astrophysics or astronomy that would say, okay, you forgot to carry the two. That mm -hmm. proves this. This proves that. You can shut down your YouTube channel and and go away. And it never happened. And then I start coming out with these challenges, saying, okay, you know, you want to prove to me that, that it's that's a globe. You're gonna have to do you know one of two things, and I I throw out these challenges. Easy. Wouldn't wouldn't cost them really that much money. No one would even entertain the idea. Mm -hmm. um, and to where now is like, I mean, there are, yes, are there some plot holes in flat earth? Yes, absolutely. But there are so many more inconsistencies with the globe, so many more that people generally go for the easier option, which is, okay, There's, flat earth makes more sense. Uh, not to you know, focus any, you know, the majority of the conversation on um, the specific writing of the book of Enoch, but I think sure. it's interesting because the, the book of Enoch will have like everything that's in here 
is you can also, well, not everything, but all the themes, all the major theological descriptions of the creation, as well as uh, how it's used in the storyline, you can still find in the rest of the scriptures as well. Yeah. But this one specifically, there's a chapter, I think it's chapter 39 or 40. It talks about Enoch's being taken to the end of the firmament, the end of the heavens. Right. To where he sees these, what he calls um, like large machines. And yeah. it, I want to call them world engines, but I think I'm stealing that from the Superman movie from 2012. But, oh, steal but, there, it. Take but it. there's there's something like, I can't remember the exact phrase he uses, and it depends on the translation as well. But basically, he sees some sort of apparatus that's a large, it is, doesn't get any description to it. It's just at the end of the heavens, at the end of the firmament. And you're like, mm, you know, I'm just wondering, is it literally possibly what's creating weather? Yeah, and and what strikes you the the more you look at it, what you were just saying there is that everything he's describing is finite. There's the the big difference here. Whereas God has always been this ethereal thing, and everything just you know wispy comes out of nowhere with lightning and thunder and stuff like that. The stuff that he was describing might as well been in inside a giant automobile factory, right? Where yeah. there was all sorts of mechanisms. He couldn't even begin to fathom what they did. But but again, because he saw a beginning and an end to them, kind of like he was saying, like the end of the you know the end of the world, the end of the firmament, you know, describing he was de describing the borders of of how this stuff you know where the winds come from, where the snow and the rain comes from. It's like what are you talking about? It doesn't come from anywhere. Oh yeah, it does. It comes from that thing right there. I saw it. I you know, and it's not like he was there for a short amount of time either, right? Yeah, that's that's one of the uh, chronological concepts that a lot of churches miss because of because this book is not in the in the modern American canon. Yeah. Um, it it was in the Ethiopian canon this whole time for right. two thousand years, right, right. as well as um, other canons. But um, most Americans, because they don't have that information. And as well as the Book of Jubilees, which tells you about Enoch's journey and back into the Garden of Eden, where he was protected for 300 years, they just go off Genesis 5:23 and Hebrews 11:5, and as a result of that, they they think that he only lived 365 years. But when you put all the Israelite literature together, you realize actually he lived 665 years, and he would have he would have overlapped with Noah's lifespan, which right. is which makes sense because in the writings of Enoch, at the end, Noah has a vision of the flood that's coming, and he runs to the edge of the garden to talk to great granddaddy Enoch and ask him, What is this vision I have? What's going on? I saw a piece of the heaven falling off <laughs> into and right. water pouring in. You know what I mean? So, right. like all of those details matter. This is it's the, the description of it is not um Gnostic, it's not ethereal, it's not non-tangible. Yeah. All of it is that. The creator lives at the top of a large structure. Um, you were created with intentionality and purpose. Yeah. He, he has this entire army of other beings that he created called angels that are messengers to help mankind on the earth with different things. Sure. And the average person, it even, you know, in one of the ancient Israelite writings, it talks about the average person doesn't even realize all this stuff is going on in heaven above them. Yeah. And so that, you know, they, therefore, you know, they, they run into destruction in their lives instead of doing what's right. And it's very interesting to see this perspective of this particular conversation uh, gets so much pushback because if the average person knew that it's a big Truman show, they would change their behavior. They would, they would. And again, yeah. I, everything for a reason, God doesn't make mistakes and kind of like why you had to turn this place into uh you know create the illusion of the globe to begin with which was creating the illusion kept people from even considering looking for it. you know people are 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 huge fiends for mystery right we love human beings love a mystery which is why in all our media you know we're we're drawn to it which is I mean, think of the the timing. You know, we had wooden horses. Sorry, wooden ships, wooden horses. We had wooden ships well, and we had horses. Right, they had a wooden horse. Well, yeah, we had that too. Whole another story. Um, we had we had ships and we had horses, and then we had you know steam engines and stuff like that. But when the globe was rolled out, we was rolled out early enough the the whole concept that by the time again we didn't until the internal combustion engine, which wasn't that long ago, we really didn't have the ability to travel any great distances. But you know, at at speed. What what if I told you that that actually is not well? Okay, okay. In our yeah, oh, that's a yeah, whole about this? other thing. The average person was not allowed to travel great right. distances or communicate at great distances. With right, right. The yeah. general public. Yeah. Um. Once once that happened, it slowed. I I'm I'm going to be jumping around here a little bit. I'm a big believer that. Real quick, Mark. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Try yeah. doing this with your camera. Put your thumb in front of it. So oh, it'll, it'll I, was that a focus, focus for a second? Yeah. Trying well, to get to just, just stay focused and I'll 
all I do is I, I can reset it like that. Uh, it's still, it still got you blurred up for some reason. Really? I don't know. Hmm. How about now? Better? It's all good. We can roll with it. Yeah. It's I'm, one, you, it's I'm, I'm like 164th a... vampire on my mother's side. <laughs> so cameras and mirrors do not love me for whatever reason. I'm not kidding. Yeah. <laughs> But but let me let me mention this really fast, which is because most people are going to be listening to it anyway. Don't stare at me. I'm not camera ready most of the time. I'm better live, which is weird. People said that it's like you don't look like you do on camera. I know, right? Um, which is I believe that he, he, every civilization has a certain amount of time here, and I think that God over the the millennia, you know, in, in making adjustments. Because again, we're not the first people to rent this apartment by a long stretch slowed everything down as much as possible. I, 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 again, I'm not trying to say I'm in the mind of God, but I think that God enjoys a longer game, you know, a longer, a longer set, which was, which is why the tower of Babel was such a short story, right? Which is again, the, the first civilization, at least in our Bible was a perfect civilization that had amazing technology. were totally united, had one language, and they figured out what this place was immediately. Right. And it's like, Oh yeah. And well, what did they do? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, they, you're right. They they rebelled against God and wanted to build a tower to get through the firmament. Well, yeah, um, because they yeah. could yeah they could get there. And again, if it's on a globe, that that building, you know, that structure that's going to reach to heaven, what's that on a globe? That's just a needle on an apple going that's around right. like this. That yeah. goes nowhere. In a stationary thing, it's just going straight up. And they were going to make it. And again, this very very short story. I'm really surprised they never expanded it into a movie, which was you know God the you know how it goes. God looks down. He's like, ah, oh, yeah, they're going to make it. Okay, here's what we're gonna do, right? <laughs> and you know, language, 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 scatter, scatter, and the tower, you know, gets reduced to whatever it is, you know, no remnant. Which is actually a phenomenon that modern scientists and etymologists cannot explain. They cannot explain why approximately four thousand years ago languages exploded sure. amongst different regions of the world. Yep. There was no slow progression. It was just suddenly everyone speaking different languages and writing different hieroglyphs. And go. so that there's only one religion on the earth that even gives an off offers an explanation, and that's Genesis eleven and uh and the god of the bible so it's very interesting yeah. um because the ultimate goal um because they're the book of genesis talks about it the book of jubilees talks about it um enoch does not talk about it because he was pre-flood but supposedly if you do the math tower of babel we're talking like two three hundred years after the flood yeah. so noah according to bible is still alive and so this is what the historian josephus claims around wow. the second century a.d is he claims that um, Nimrod was the one who uh, rose to power and was the leader of the United Peoples, specifically because Noah was like the Grand Poobah. He's like, you know, 900 something years old at this point. Right. And he made it from both sides of the flood. And he was warning them not to rebel against God. Sure. <laughs> Why would he? Like, I just made it through this flood, guys. And so <laughs> apparently, Nimrod's like emotional tactic on the people, according to the historian, was that he, he, caused them to think that it was courageous to rebel against God because God was a big meanie for flooding all the wicked people before the flood, right? So all yeah. the people that were raping, pillaging, and murdering and creating chimera giants and uh, destroying the genome of mankind, all those people were, you know, should not have been judged, apparently. So this is the mindset of someone that's lost into their their selfish depravity, right? Is they they look at God's judgment and they say, well, oh, no, he, he was unjust to judge those people who were killing the world and all the people in it. Sure. And so they then decided we don't want him to flood us again. So instead of us dispersing across the earth, like Noah instructed them to do, instead, we're just going to all centralize and build a tower to get to him and kill him and take over his authority. There and that's go. why it means in Genesis 11, when it talks about, they wanted to uh, create a, a tower to heaven so they can make a name for themselves. Sure. That word, that word name in Hebrew means authority. Yeah. yeah. Bold bold move i gotta tell right. you right I, I, yeah so think about the the uh crazy mind of, of someone like that right so you're thinking oh so granddaddy no or great granddaddy no is telling me that this you know the reason why we see all this damaged earth is because it was this massive flood and yep. the people the, pe the person who made us in this enclosure is the one who flooded us for our bad behavior right. so instead of just doing what he says which he says is the outpouring of love I'm going to go try to take him out so I can do what I want. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's so, yeah. And of course the, the Satan character is a part of this. They were, according to ancient writings, the tower of Babel, they were worshiping um, Jupiter, uh, which is the Greek version of the Hebrew word for Satan. Um, as far as Jupiter being their, their head pantheon God. Yeah. And so that's what's another unique thing that um, I'm surprised. I, I didn't know you read the book of Enoch. I'm surprised that 
you mentioned it because in the book of Enoch, it talks about the rebellious angels of heaven that came down and started taking wives and doing that and creating giants. Yep. Yep. And the only one that didn't get put in Tartarus, which is a deep hole in the ground the, of the rebellious angels, was this character Azazel, whom the, the Hebrews knew as the Satan character. Hmm. And so he's still around after the flood to, to pick up the shenanigans again. Sure. And this is the one that uh, Nimrod endeared himself to is the the Jupiter character, the, the Azazel character. So that's that's the actual story from the for the Israelites from the ancient sure. Hebrews, and sure. uh, and that's that's how it kind of like. So if that's the case, Mark, we we know from testing and observation that the description from the scriptures is where we live. Yeah, because the description from the world is contradictory to everything we can test, see, and observe. Right. So then, does that mean that the characters in the literature of the ancient Israelites is also real information? So, if that's the case, then that yeah. means there there is a character running around that is a rebellious angel who can't go back to heaven. Yeah. He's stuck here with us yeah. until the second coming of the Son of Man, yeah. and he's trying to trick people to do a bunch of destructive things. And and I'm just sitting there going like, where is he? Right, right. I, Have, well, again, did, did you see my presentation at Floods Over Fest a couple years ago? Unfortunately, I I usually get drugged into. Once I'm in the lobby, I, I can't. I got you. I it was I, when I wasn't on stage, I lost my voice because I was talking nonstop. So <laughs> I, I understand what you feel like. Well, to to, to try, see if I can try to answer your question, um, there's something I've said on on different occasions where you know what the the first rule of power has never really changed. And I don't care if we're, we're talking about even the supernatural, which is mm -hmm. uh, the first rule is stay hidden, which right. is you cannot be, the Napoleon said it best, which is you can't be overthrown if they don't know who you are. That's right. right. Uh, and that applies to any trickster, I would imagine, or any any villain of any, I mean, yes, of course, there's some that, that are so bold that they would they'll push themselves into the spotlight and, and that generally doesn't go well. But um, I think I think because I do believe the scriptures are real. I do sure. believe the information there is accurate. Yeah. I think we can see a lot of evidence for it, both uh, historically, anthropologically and archaeologically. Yeah. And so personally, I do believe that angels are real entities that the creator made yeah. um, and that they all have free will. So a few of them went rogue. Right. Yeah. Sure. And as a result. They, the majority of those got punished, but one's left out because he didn't do the same sins as the other majority. So he didn't get the same punishment, according to the book of Enoch. Right. And and he's still out roaming around seeking whom he may devour, as Second Peter calls him, right? The, right. the, the dragon, the lion that seeks to, to right. destroy people. So if that's the case, and I agree with you, I think he had his um, bombastic arc, if I could put it like that. I think he had his like um, you know, I'm Zeus, I'm Jupiter, I'm, I'm going to rule right. and people are going to know who I am. I think right. he had that arc and now he's into the, I'm going to be the shadow man. Yeah. Because yeah, I, it got I, too, I, it got too weird. Did you know that I actually found an 18th century BC uh, manuscript from the ancient Egyptians? It's called the book of the heavenly cow. And it talks about how, uh, Ra tried to, was living amongst mankind on the earth mm -hmm. until they rebelled against him. And then he decided to go live in the air. This is the same story of Zeus, the same story of Baal, the same story of Ninurta, the or and, some of the other Chaldean gods, and the original Stargate movie. <laughs> that's right. That's by right. the way, yeah, yeah. By the way, yeah, that's which, right. Which then was turned into a, a very long running, one of the longest running sci-fi series of all time. Yeah. So I agree with you. I think it's the uh, you know it's the usual suspects line, right? The greatest trick the devil ever pulled yeah. is to make the world think he doesn't exist, and yeah. um, he is the ultimate Kaiser Sose, and. With that in mind, like that means at some point, at some level of hierarchy to the people that want to control this world, they must know that all their behavior is, is antithetical to the Bible. Yeah. So that means they serve a different master. Yes. So yes. at some point, you got to have a board meeting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the, the mythological, whatever you want to call it. I call it the authority. Uh, yeah. And I'm stealing from a graphic novel series that I, that I own. Um, if you want to call it the Illuminati, I mean, the, one of the great things about power structures, especially the secret sinister types, is that, again, true power stays hidden. And if you ask the average truth or community member, you know, list me the top 10 um, secret societies in order of importance, right? 
you won't get the same 10 from from all these different people you know because you know how many are out there you know the the bilderberg the rothschilds the trilateral you know the the, the vatican society you know some sort of jewish cabal the masons it just goes on and it never ends right and everyone says oh this group's on top this group's on top i mean i you know i sit at the conferences and and i listen to these arguments usually over alcohol where, where people are just going back and forth and i go that's what they want you to do um you know the, the line from jfk where you know the 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 who is just window treatment you know all these different groups it could be it could be any of them for me but yes at what you just said there at the highest levels yes they know um as a matter of fact you know something i i pointed out to people uh in one of the speeches i don't know if it was a speech that you it was the conference you were at but i was talking about you know how my um my my grandfather was a 32nd degree mason um, and he would never made it to be a 33rd. And if you don't know anything about the Masons, you can buy your way up to 32, right? Because each degree, by the way, costs money. Most people don't know that. But you cannot make the jump on your own. You can't even ask. You have to be shoulder tapped. And yes, there have been 30 seconds that have come out and disclosed stuff, you know, about, oh, here's the ritual, pant leg and poke in, you know, the, oh, the whole light and the the Hiram of Biff stuff. But no 33rd has ever come forward, ever. And what I think is when you make it to be a 33rd, because they, I think they psychologically screen you. And then once you get to that point, they level with you. And they say, here's the deal. You know, you you have the psychological profile. We think you're pretty much going to listen to this guy anyway. <laughs> and they do. And that's it. That's That's the end. So yeah, do I think there's sinister meetings at the highest order? Yeah, you bet I do. Why, why wouldn't you? That's, that's part of the allure, isn't it? You know, to, to bring them in. If you're going to, you're going to do dark things anyway, get working your way up the chain. I don't care if it's pollution or murder or trafficking or whatever it is. When you get to that highest level, you, you're going to want, you know, yes, if there's someone that you think is the epitome of all that, that, that puts you to shame. Oh yeah. You're going to follow them. You bet you, you're going to anyway. Sorry. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. I can only imagine the recruiting speech is, is not so blatantly oh. obvious, right? It's right. more of like, here's, you know, if I could write the script, so to speak, right? Yeah. Here's, they bring you in and they say, you know, hey, here's here's how the world works. Here's your, who's here really controls the world. These industries, these are the heads of those people. These are their, the the handlers above those people. Like, and here's the, you know, uh, the the black pope, if you will, whatever you want to call that. Right. Like, here, here's all the people at the, the unseen realm. They That in itself is a form of indoctrination because now they're entrusting you. And you, you probably realize at that point, if they're showing me this, I can't tell anybody. Otherwise, I'm dead. Right. Yeah. So and my whole family and probably my whole town and all that kind of stuff. So well, it to me, it's like they would then bring you in to say, look, we're not showing you this because because we're the bad guys. We're showing you this because we're trying to help humanity. We're the good guys. Right. The the line it's been used in many, many a thing over the years, which is the greater good. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we do it for the great. And believe it or not. You know, I understand some of the, you know, some of the lesser conspiracies we won't, we won't go necessarily go into them, but I want to mention uh, the three, three days of the condor reference be, um, after that, which is the, the greater good means that it, when I look at conspiracies, I look at it from their, their standpoint, I put myself in their shoes and I go, okay, do can I see, can I kind of envision what they're going for here? Um, meaning do the need, you know, do the, the. Uh, the means justify the end, right? What what they're doing, you know? Will are you willing to sacrifice this many people to to get what you want? And then, of course, they'd say, well, you know, for the benefit of civilization. But to your point, as far as not talking and why there's so very few whistleblowers, uh, there's a great um, uh, Robert Redford movie called uh, Three Days of the Condor back in his heyday, back in the um, God early '70s, about CIA versus CIA crime. He worked for a CIA group, and there was another, and there was a it was a research group, and they got caught finding out something the another group happened and they they went to war with each other this group got wiped out and he was going to go to the new york times right and this is this is the point i wanted to make so and the the end of the movie was him ye yelling at his his former boss who turned out to be corrupt and he goes no i've already given it to him i've already given it to you know the new york so he points at the building right and the new york boss is worried for a second right then he then he looks and he goes how do you know they'll run it and he goes they'll <laughs> run the heels they'll run it and he goes really how do you know, right? Meaning we have people everywhere. Right. There's no way, and probably uh, an editor, Mockingbird. Yeah, yeah. So there's there, there's no way you're getting through that filter. So which when people say, people yell at me and they 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 say, oh, you know, an astronaut would have whistleblowed by now. It's like, okay, first of all, 
there's only been like less than 600 people that even claim to have gone to space, right? You know, and all those people would be psychologically screened. They're all military. All their phones are tapped. Their email is tapped. Th their mail is, you know, everything is, is tracked just in case they even inkling of going in the wrong direction, right? So don't tell me that. And even if you could, you know, I, I'll throw the question at you. If you had one shot, right, you know, you were going to be a whistleblower. What media source are you going to? Exactly. Yeah. You, where, are you going to yeah. go to CNN? You going to go to Fox? You going to MSNBC? You going to go to Newsmax? You going to Infowars? <laughs> what group can you go to where you're absolutely one hundred percent sure that you're going to get through and that story is going to get out there? There are so many layers of security along the way. I'm not. I'm not trying to be doom and gloom there, but no, no, it's, I mean, this is the fight, right? Um, the, you know, media is a big deal, so this is definitely the fight. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot uh, that goes into this conversation as far as not just the reality of where we live and and you know because my understanding is that if people understood the reality of where they live, they'd realize they were created, they would realize right. that there's purpose for them. They're not on a uh, spinning water ball that's flinging aimlessly into a solar system yeah. in some insignificant speck on insignificant portion of the universe. And as Neil deGrasse Tyson describes it, because yeah. the Bible, you know, the God of the Bible I read says that he he does view us as important and we do have purpose and he made us for a reason. He wants to have fellowship with us and that, um, he will be for, he, he will, he's a gentleman. Like he doesn't just impose to say like, I'm going to go here and, um, I'm not, I'm going to override everybody's free will and right. only make a utopian society. He lets it play out because that actually is the ultimate intelligence. Um, otherwise you don't know if people truly want to be with you or not. Right. Well, oh heck, look at the, look at the line, look at Job. For example, right. you know, I, I, it kills me to this day because you, what you're thinking about free will, whereas like it's like he allows trolls. Job was trolling him, right? Criticizing his his design. And, and, and you know, God's like, you know, the, the famous quote, it's like, which sounds like an old guy quote, which is like, where, where were you? <laughs> right. I built yeah. this, right? Where were you? I built this whole, you know, the, the line that, that you know, well, anyone senior I citizens, was, I was doing this before you were a gleam in your daddy's eye, you know, that whole thing. That's what God was saying. But the fact that he even allowed Job to take it that far is like, really? This is yeah. Something. What's interesting about that, those last few chapters of Job is that he starts off those questions to Job, those rhetorical questions to Job. Right. He starts them off with, um, brace yourself, gird up your loins. I'm about to ask you some questions. Right. It's when I was younger, I always thought that sounded tough. You know what I mean? I was like, wow, that's, that kind of sounds tough. But now as I've been doing interviews with people, I realize how actual literal that is yeah. because I've interviewed people that refuse to answer my questions Wow. because they're they're They know what, what it will cost them. Ah. You know what I'm saying? And Got so it. they, they don't want to answer like a man. And I've been in debates where pastors refuse to answer. Instead, they, they engage in ad hominem, personal attacks or whatever. Right. And these are pastors, right? They're not supposed to act like that. Right. But the, the veneer comes off because they realize they are too afraid of what the actual truth is and they won't even answer the questions. So it, it's very fascinating to see the interaction with Job because he, uh, he does get restored because he does answer. Well, at least he, he endures the questioning. And, uh, and admits that he's unworthy, basically. Right. And yeah. again, the, the fact that God, not just free will, but God seems to have created randomness that even he, that, that even he shielded from. You know, um, there, there was an old line from Einstein, you may have remembered from back in the day, which was, um, God doesn't play dice. And then it turned into an argument between he and Hawking, even though Hawking, they, you know, they, they didn't know each other because one was dead. Um, but Hawking's like, oh no, no, God does, God does play dice and, and blah, blah, blah. And, and Stephen Hawking didn't understand what Einstein was saying. Believe what you want about Einstein's math and his theories and everything. He was very quotable. The man had amazing, amazing quotes. And the, the, what I, what I'm getting at there is that God, when he said God didn't play dice, he meant that God wrote dice. He created dice. So God, there's nothing, there's no throw of the dice that God wouldn't have intimate knowledge of in, in doing so. Unless, of course, he limited himself to where, kind of like people, where dice, dice. he doesn't know the, the, how the throw is going to go. You know, he temporarily blocks that part out. Just, oh, I'm kind of curious how this is going to land. Kind of like with people. You know, that conversation with Job shouldn't have happened in a perfect structure type thing. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, you're right. It's interesting because the entire conversation with Job only happened because of chapters one and two, where Azazel, that Satan character, 
goes to heaven and asks God, can I mess with Job? Sure. So think about this for a minute, because a lot of Christians overlook this part of the book of Job. Yeah. And they think, because they don't understand the ferment reality that is described in scripture. Right. So that means he still could go up to the top layer of the firmament and present himself to the Almighty. Because right. it says on that on that occasion, the angels came before God and Satan came with them. And then God responds, where have you been? Never, As if he doesn't know. Thank you, by the way, for bringing that up. Yeah. Never forget, and I, I know I'm belittling the point here, but you guys understand. Never never forget that in the, in the big scheme of things, Azazel is an employee of God. Right. Well, I personally, I, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, go ahead. We're, we're here, but in, I'm, I'm saying, I know I'm, I'm not going to be able to do the mortal equivalent, but I'll give you one really quick. Uh, you remember Willy Wonka and the, the chocolate factory? Or was it Charlie and the chocolate factory? Willy Wonka, the first yeah. one with Gene Wilder, right? Yeah. The, the actual one. Yeah. The, <laughs> exactly. The one that matters. The, yeah. the, what, what everyone overlooks at, at the end, the very end of the movie, it was glossed over in like 10 seconds, which was Slugworth. You know the evil guy, you know the the evil German guy, that that came, you know that was that was tempting the kids, you know that set the kids all up to fail. He shows up at the end, right? Walks right into Willy Wonka's office, kind of like you know, and and uh, and and the you know Charlie's like, oh my God, it's him, and uh, oh no, no, it's Mister Slugworth. He he works for me, and then just waves him off, right? And that's it, right? And you and that in that moment you realize all the kids were set up to fail. Mm -hmm. He knew how the whole thing was going to play out. He knew that Charlie may or may not actually give the thing back at the end. But the fact was there was no bad guy, no official bag, no, no anonymous self, you know, um, self-creating bad guy. It was, it was, he had the whole thing scripted, which is why I tell people, look at everything. There's a plan in all of this. You just don't see it yet, but sorry, go ahead. So, so yeah, now you're jumping into some deep philosophy, right? I do. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. No, it's okay. Cause Christians argue this all the time yeah. and it, it goes off of uh, actual philosophy from um, ancient Platonism and, you know, then it became Neoplatonism and it's this idea of a determinism there you go. and that's what you're talking about, right? Yep. Which is the idea that the creator of all things must know. And, and, and some people take it to a different degree. So not only that he must know everything's going to happen, but um, Christians around the, the the age of the reformers, the 15th, 16th century, they took it to a greater degree to say all evil is actually co-signed by God. And that's where you run into some serious moral issues with, and then, and then they try to use the story of Job and Satan coming before God to, you know, to ask to tempt Job right. um, for that, for their justification, for that thought, that philosophical premise of determinism that right. both good and bad sin and good behavior is both co-signed by God. But then that makes God the author of evil, which goes against the general premise of the God of the Bible. So this is where I think it's so important to know the, the greater amounts of literature that comes from the history of the, the, the written scriptures, like Jubilee's Enoch, where it directly tells you that Satan was just a, a rebellious employee sure. who went off script and decided that um, he needed, and they, they end up creating the Nephilim who then are now what, what Jesus encountered as the unclean spirits because they lost their bodies in the flood or before the flood technically. But so, but these were created, as it says in Enoch 15, they were created in order to destroy and tempt mankind. So and mankind had a genuine enemy trying to kill it. And it was this, these rebellious angels with their genetically mutated and hybridized offspring right. that were not just different in the way they looked. They didn't look like normal men, but they were actually partially a spiritual being which is different than mankind mm -hmm. this is why once they lost their body they're still around as unclean spirits only to be finally destroyed at the second coming of the messiah right. so this is the the story of the scriptures and why it, it's so important for christians and in, in my opinion people that are considering is the scriptures real and should i even care to, to know all this backstory because it is the world we encounter today yeah. right when you see the leaders of the world intentionally making decisions to destroy people and you're like, what? Why? Well, it's because they've adopted the philosophy and the mantra of the Watchers and the Nephilim, which yeah. they made themselves enemies of mankind. Yeah. So yeah. there's even a joking, uh, like political commentators, you know, like conservative political commentators and others, they even jokingly use this phrase nowadays when they're analyzing politics and they'll say, it's the death cult. Like all these policies are trying to kill 
people. Like they're pro-abortion, they're pro-euthanasia at all ages. They're pro, you know, uh, poisons in our food. They're pro, you know, like poisons in our sky, poisons on our crops. Like there, it's a death cult. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's it's funny right. to see like why would anybody be motivated to ascribe to that kind of stuff? Well, well many of them do so because they believe in a deterministic God who claims that he gave the okay for the for the wicked to be wicked and that's technically not what the bible says he actually says he's he hates those people that are wicked and he's going to come back and judge them and actually establish order on the earth in the future that's that's the goal no, no i got you i got you and at the higher levels you, you're probably right there are some people that do it for for evil's sake but as you know to tempt men and women lesser so um to tempt men it doesn't take much of a carrot Right to That's to true. do it, you know, we between, yeah. you know, between power and money or sexual things or whatever. As long as it is not tough to do, there are there. Everyone's got a, a price when you get to that certain level, and those prices are easy, easy to. Oh, by the way, real quick, um, I I, I didn't want to forget this. You want to see? I'm sure you probably watched them, or one of them at least. Um, two movies lightly based on Job, which in mainstream would have been uh, bedazzled. The Oh my God! Watch it. the the first one, which was Dudley Moore, that played uh, Job, basically, but it was a different name, Stanley Moon. And oh wait, are you talking about the nineteen seventies uh, show where he's like an ancient BC and he's an no, idol maker? No, 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 not that one. No, it was in uh, it was in modern day London, which would have been I think around the late nineteen sixties. <laughs> but the the modern or the they then they remade it with Brendan Fraser in um oh boy early two thousands. Directed, okay. directed by Harold Ramis, and it's where where the devil is tempting, you know, a single character in multiple different timelines, multiple timelines, and he would, you know, gave him his wishes, and that that was the whole point. It's like okay, and all the wishes, of course, turned out bad, and you know, in the end, you know, uh, the devil and God had a dialogue, but but yeah, God let it happen. And it's like okay, you know, I'm pretty sure, you know, he's gonna he's gonna hang tough. Yeah, what's what's interesting about Job is that he does say to Satan, um, yes, but you cannot, he says, you can do this, but you cannot do these other things to him. There so he go. does, and this is why Job, or excuse me, this is why Satan, the second time in chapter two, he complains to God and says, well, but you've put a hedge of protection around it. And he goes, well, you can, you, you can lay, you can't, he, he, the, in the dialogue, God ends up saying to, to Satan, you can, um, something to the effect of you can, Go after him, but you can't lay. A, you know, you can't kill him. Basically, no, no. I right. mean, you, yeah. you got to set up some ground rules, right? right? You're gonna right. do stuff like that. So otherwise, you otherwise is, you get ugly really fast. Yeah, exactly. That's where I personally think that that's uh, we see that in the Book of Jubilees, where in chapter forty nine it talks about the Exodus from, from Egypt and how um, Satan was actually locked up for four days during the time when they they sure. went they left Egypt. And when started to uh, travel towards the actual uh, Red Sea before it crossed, and that's when Satan was let back out. Was when he convinced the Egyptian rulers and their armies to go after him yeah. and meet him at the Red Sea. So that's yeah. what the Book of Jubilees claims. And so then, if that's true, yeah, then that's a perspective that the average person doesn't understand. And I hope to portray this that Satan's not all powerful. Or, or any malevolent forces that are out there, according to you know scripture, that he's not all powerful. Um, he's actually at the whim of the of the ultimate lawmaker, which is the creator of heaven and earth. And yeah. so he has to abide by certain rules. Otherwise, he's not he's not going to ask permission to tempt people. It is, yeah, it is. Well, not not to go into writing. I, I do love good writing, which is look the hero's journey. The villain de yeah. defines the hero, and they have to be. Even if it's an illusion, they have to appear to be somewhat evenly matched in some aspect. Even yeah. though, come on, you know, Superman can be <laughs> can take out all his villains simultaneously if he wanted, but he doesn't because what? What's the what's? How does that work? Le out? That's Lex always pulls up a green rock at the right time. Yeah, that's so a short story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The green rock out of nowhere. I don't know. Always the freaking green rock. But but again, it's the illusion of it. So yeah, I. I so there's a there's a unique passage in the Wisdom of Solomon, and it says um, that the creation relaxes itself on behalf of those who do what's right. 
And so, and it, and it's inversely, it says that it, it goes against, it will actually rebel against the behaviors uh, that are not designed for it. Right. So this is why in the covenant in the old Testament, that God's explained to the Israelites, he's like, look, if you do all these things, everything's going to go well, your crop will be in due season. You'll have rain that you'll, you'll have peace with your enemies. Everything will be good. You'll have joy with your families. But if you start doing all these wicked behaviors, like all these other nations, your land will be famine ridden. Your enemies will start invading you. You'll yep. be weak and sick. And so this is what we see unfold throughout all nations throughout time, yep. Yep. you know, is when they lose their moral fiber, the creation rebels against them in order to wipe them off the earth. Yep. And so this is a very unique concept where, and then you got someone like the, like Jesus Christ comes along without sin and he can just heal people at random. He can calm the seas at, at will. He can do all the miracle. He can walk on water because the, the, according to scripture, the creation relaxes itself on behalf of the righteous, meaning basically it lends itself to work with those who do what's right. right. So it's a very interesting paradigm. And what I'm seeing when I see the world start, the, the information age has, has exploded with the internet and now specific truths have come out that are causing more of a ruckus than other truths, right? right? Because, so think about it like this, 2000, you know, 1995 to 2000, the internet starts really getting out there. AOL, you know, everyone's making fun of their AOL messages. Right. The average preacher is not jumping online because they don't realize the power of it yet. Yeah. But then they start to go, wait a minute, I can reach more people than just my community by getting online and talking about the Bible. Yeah. So, oh yeah, missions made easy, right? Like I can do that. And so then they start trying to do that. But then it becomes people who aren't in explicitly going to church and trying to learn about the creator suddenly get hit with the truth, like where we live and the shape of where we live. Yeah. And like my, uh, you know, co-host on Uncoming Ground West plays, he actually was brought to Christ and faith in Christ because of biblical cosmology. Yes. Oh, so many people have, yeah. um, do you, y'all forgive me. Did, did you attend some of the take on the world conferences? Uh, yes. Okay. So 2021, I was there. Okay. The, you know, I heard, I don't think it was that year. I think it was a, um, a year earlier, or could have been two years earlier, which was, you know, I, I had heard from a lot of people in the Christian community that one of the things that the whole biblical cosmology or flat earth or enclosed world or whatever you want to call it did was it gave people um, a resurgence towards spirituality, towards you know, it's just like, because again, the obvious, which is if we're giving this world a structure, if this world actually has a structure, that means it was built. That means it was created and it had to have been created by someone. And then you're really just splitting hairs. You, who, who are you going to think it's going to be? You know, it can only be one of two things. And because of that, there were, I, I got letters from so many people that said, oh yeah, I'm back in the church now because mm -hmm the uh because now i now i uh, it it gave them those extra few percentage points that had them on the fence you know they they had gotten lazy and it's like ah, i haven't been to church in years now i'm going back uh and i heard that's from people in this take on the world conference it's like I, they'd never even seen a recruiting tool that got <laughs> people back into the into the into the pews that, that this did for obvious yeah. reasons right and then they asked their pastor to explain it and their pastor yeah. kick, kicks them back out of the church yeah so <laughs> yeah it's a it's a challenging topic because um you it forces people to uh take their bible extremely seriously right and the average christian in the united states at least um we've fallen into so many different denominations and so many different uh licenses to interpret differently Right. And still claim to be of the same faith. This is why when I saw this growing up, because, you know, my dad was a pastor for some time. Now he does, um, or he has orphanages in different countries. And and then growing up, I became a Christian in 97 and tried to read my Bible throughout. And I, and I was going to different churches and I realized that all these different churches didn't agree with each other. And I was like, this is, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Uh, I read in Ephesians 4 that it's one body, one faith, one Lord, one spirit. And like, we're supposed to be unified. Like, this is supposed to be like one body of God, like the family of God, like what's going on here? And I did more deeper research because it didn't make sense to me. And I thought like, I don't want to be a part of something that's a sham. Obviously that's not true. So like, let's dig deeper. The, the, the most craziest thing is, you know, how they say like, um, I had this old track coach who used to tell me, uh, keep it simple, stupid. That sure. was his catchphrase, right? I know Kid, it. The kiss principle. Yep. 
And I started to apply that in my thought process of like trying to figure out why all these churches have these different interpretations and why everyone's so not undivided instead of unified. Yeah. And I thought, I'll just keep it simple. Let's, and then, and then I don't know, maybe it's God. I don't know. Maybe, you know, I, I attribute it to the Holy Spirit in my life, like leading me to truth, but I just started to define words. Yeah. And when I started to actually define words, I realized, oh, they're arguing over different definitions. Sure. And this is literally the extension of the original deception we see in Genesis 3 when the serpent says, did God really say this? Like that was his opening line in the Bible. Did God really say this? Like what if he meant this? You know what I mean? Yeah. And then he got Adam and Eve immediately to reinterpret the very, very, very plain instructions. Yeah, creating so, doubt. Yeah. Creating doubt. So when I yeah. talk to a pastor and I say, here's the definition of the ferment. Here's how it was used in the flood. Here's how it's going to be used when Christ returns. Here's why it matters because the new Jerusalem literally sets down through it on the earth. It's the father's tabernacle that sets on the earth that all nations come to and learn how to behave properly. And they look at me and go, Oh, what are you a flat earther? And I'm like, okay, so I'm realizing now <laughs> that you don't actually believe your Bible. Right. And then there comes this weird rub. Are they going to be intellectually honest? Or are they going to, you know, just cover their eyes and cog this? Yeah. And it's been quite the journey. So I guess a little bit, in addition to Rob Skiba, I definitely have you to blame for all this trust <laughs> that I've experienced in the past six years with these pastors. But uh, but I really want to give you a big thanks, though, right? Because um, I know that you, I mean, do you, do you consider yourself a Christian or do you consider yourself someone that is still investigating? And Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I... I never really swayed when you know from my roots okay. which was you know I, I was saved back you know in my in my late teens and then when i got again when i got into tech again if you, if you have nothing but super heavy nerd friends you're not going to church a lot you're you're gaming on the weekends yes. and i was it's like ah, i got it's fine you know and i just like let things slide um but when i got into this I developed a whole new relationship with God, so much more respect and so much more physical, practical, you know, my own Enoch type of experience where, you know, I'm looking at the model because that's how I really got into this was I was looking at the world for, in a whole new light, you know, different eyes. And I was saying, OK, what were you trying to do here? Right? And everything I found was genius. It was absolutely brilliant. All the little nuances of where we are and, and the design um, uh, perspectives which was just amazing to where, I, you know, every every year, you know, for the last nine years, I'm, I'm still learning new things all the time. And and which is why it's like, you know, I, I thank God every well, at least every week. And it's like, wow, you really did some neat stuff here. Uh, and yeah, a lot of people that don't understand it, a lot of people still upset with you, but, but I get it. I totally get it. And, uh, he has, um, he has looked over me in ways in hindsight that I never, you know, even the, going back to the fireworks thing, I shouldn't have been, I should be blown into a million pieces <laughs> so yeah. many times. There's so many blunderous, you know, the, the, the old saying, you know, fools rush in, you know, where angels fear to mm -hmm. tread. That was me. For a lot, I mean, whatever angels were looking over my shoulders, like, oh man, not again, because I, I, I again, you know, was naive. But now, yes, my my belief in God Almighty and the power that created this thing has is stronger than it's ever been. So, there cool. you go. well, that's that's encouraging, yeah. Because I know there's a there's a lot of people in the um, you know the truth FE community that. Uh, they do acknowledge that this place was created. They just still struggle with the God of the Bible itself. Sure, and so, sure. And, yeah, they, and, because for whatever reason, maybe their upbringing, maybe some trauma, maybe just a lack of information, a lack of knowledge. You know. Yeah, and and as you know, church sometimes it, again it's easy for me to say because I grew up, you know, in, in a evangelical Christian home. Uh, but I I understand where it sometimes rub, rubs people the wrong way. It really comes down to who you're hanging out with in those first yeah. impressions, right? You know, if it if yeah, it, it can go bad, and then you're you're digging you know digging your spirit you're digging yourself outside of out of a spiritual hole, and it's not always not always pretty. But. So if you so what this is a fun question I've been pondering for the last few years, yeah. and I'm sure you've probably had the same thought. But yeah. uh, and I was when I was talking to Witsit uh, a few nights back or so like a month ago, um, I, we we mentioned this briefly, but I, I really start to think that the 
I think that the the deception as the big deception as a whole is generationally, like by next generation, 10, 15 years from now, yeah. um, there it's gonna get harder and harder to maintain the the big lie, right? Yeah. Yeah. Especially as unless they create like World War Three and turn the internet off. Yeah. Right. But but in that you're losing your your ultimate tool to influence. To control. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. yeah. So it's a double edged sword for them. I always laugh yeah. and say that, you know, they create the internet thinking they control people, but actually they just allow people to find information out faster to break free from their deceptions. But ultimately, yeah, so my thought was, and I was telling Wits at this, I was like, look, what if they try to uh take the, they see the trends and then they just try to say, look we're just going to admit it. We're just going to say, yeah, this, you actually live in a structure and it was created, yeah. but they're never going to give credit to the God of the Bible. They'll just say, and here is the, the Pam Spermia progenitor who's returned. And oh, he's yeah. the one who created this. Yeah. Place. You could, you could do that. You could, I mean, Oh God, there's, there's so many theories, but yes, you could, I mean, you could land a freaking golden spaceship in the middle of London and yeah. have whoever you want come out. Yeah. And as long as it seems somewhat legit, I mean, you know, the 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 internet would microscope it to death, but so it's got to be somewhat real. Um there would be there would be some people that would follow, uh which is probably why it hasn't happened. They they but that's a one-shot deal. Yes, it is. And you 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 can't screw this up, which is why I think they're so nervous. The same reason why they they've never gone back to the moon, right? And you know, I joke, but I'm not kidding where i say look if somebody came to me because i consider myself a fairly clever problem solver and you offered me a trillion dollars then you said hey can you help us fake the the a moon mission by you know 2030 i'd be like no no there's no way i could do it someone's gonna screw up there's gonna be a little mistake that's gonna be made and that's all it's just game over at that point um sorry let me do a, a separate tangent thing really quick to give people an example the very first lord of the rings movie you probably knew this maybe you didn't if you can find it on the internet i'm pretty sure which is it made it all the way from inception all the way to theatrical cut and all of a sudden somebody in the middle of i don't know la or new york watches you know is watching the movie and the, the hobbits are leaving the shire and there's a road off in the corner of the screen and there's a white car driving through it <laughs> and they're like and he's like what the hell is that thing doing there, right? Imagine the amount, the hundreds and thousands of people that watched that film and edited and sound and all the splicing and nobody caught that because they were staring in the wrong place. They, they weren't staring off in the corner. They were staring. It's like, you know, the, the hobbits look pretty real running through the shire. Yeah, it's like, forget about the car, right? That's all it would take, right? Which is in the you know if you want to fake anything i don't care if it's project blue beam or the moon mission or whatever you better nowadays like you said the double-edged sword the 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 internet is microscopes everything to such a level you can't screw it up because it, it sticks you, you can't you can't pull it off there's no magical thing that can scrub any you know anything from the internet if it's out there for 10 minutes it's over That's so right. yeah. yeah um that's, when it, a, that's a psa to all the young ladies listening do not do only fans anyway no no so we, definitely don't do, do don't i mean do it. yeah yeah it's it's unfortunate yeah. because well how the economy is set up there's so many people that you know that especially gen zers you know they're scrambling for money and they'll, they'll do anything like look we gotta make we gotta we gotta it's all about the benjamins and or in this case all about any money and so yeah women yeah don't do it yeah <laughs> don't don't do it guys don't it's, do it feed picks bad, not worth it no it is not worth well yeah because again it sticks with you Right. Yeah, we, yeah. Which is do you like have trouble? Earth. Do you have trouble finding relationships and jobs later in your oh life? Oh my God! Yeah, well, especially jobs. Yeah. Although, who knows nowadays? You know, depending on what HR person you're you're dealing with, it'd be like, hey. yeah, yeah. I recognize you. Yeah, well, um, the worst the worst is when I see teachers doing it. By the way, when you yeah, when you write about are, that, yeah, like, are you, how dumb are you? Come on, and and you know they have no regrets. Like you know how much money I was making. It's like, oh, okay, well. Yeah, well, stop teaching and just do that. Then. Yeah, it's like yeah. you wasted your masters, but that's yeah. fine, I guess. Uh, hard, hard shift here, hard segue. Yeah. O'Neill Colonies, Jeff Bezos, given uh, live speaking presentations about the goal for humanity by the year 2050 to live in O'Neill Colonies. Are you familiar with those ideas? Mm, no. What's another, what, give me, what's another so term for an O'Neill Colony would be uh, an a livable habitat in low earth orbit. Oh yeah, that crap. Uh, no, 
No. So no. Even even as like two or three years ago, he's still out there talking about this is the goal for 2050 and for those and for the future generation is to get the majority um, of the not the not the industrial class, yeah. but more like the you know the administrative class, right? Um, it's it's like Elysium, like the movie Elysium with Matt. Oh Damon. yeah, no, I, I know that movie well. Yeah. No. No, no. It, no. In fact, all the space story. You know, I read stories every space stories every week on my on my Tuesday thing, and it is just to reinforce space. That's all it is. It is a, mm -hmm. it is a headline. And when you are an eccentric billionaire tied to a company that's highly media friendly, whatever you say is instant headlines. Jeff Bezos actually doesn't even get a tenth of the headlines that like Elon gets. Right. I've, I've got people, I've got family members that swear that he is the smartest man in the world, that he is, he is the, why the news media hasn't like put him and Tony Stark right across <laughs> from each other in, in a picture and like doing some sort of morph. I have no idea. And, and I try to remind well, they anyone just, that they could just take the screenshot from Iron Man 2 when they shook hands. Oh, dude, don't get me started. I, it, every, what, what kills me is, you know, again, the power of perception, you know, power perceived is power achieved. The media has drilled into people. It's like, oh, look what he's done. And I, and I, I'll call people on, I go, really? What's he done? Tell me exactly how he made his money. Tell me exactly what he's doing right now. Did he engineer anything at SpaceX? No. Did he build, you know, Tesla? No, he bought it. You know, did he start PayPal? No, thank God they removed that from Wiki. Everything, you know, he, the underground bullet train from San Francisco to Los Angeles. No, the super plane that's going to go to China in two hours. No, he was going to save those kids with his little mini submarine in that cave. No, just went oh again and again and again. He just says stuff and then people assume it happened. So when that's he true. says, oh, no, I've got a Mars program. It's absolutely going to happen, you know, in 2040. Right. At the same time, I read a headline just last week and the headline was SpaceX rocket launches and doesn't explode. That was the high point. It's like, right. really? That's your high point that it didn't detonate <laughs> two minutes yeah. after launch? And we're still talking about um, not only can he not consistently or supposedly the narrative that they give to him is that he can't consistently put a rocket up that that works. But then when it does work, it somehow lands backwards. Oh, the, the the exact opposite than any engineering student would ever tell you. That is right. not how you land a cylinder. Right. It does yeah. not work that way. Yeah. Not, not to mention little things. I don't want to go off in a rant, but come on. The average person doesn't realize, like, look, only the Americans even said they went to the moon, stopped in 1972, and none of the other launch-capable countries, that being um, China, Japan, Europe, Russia, and who is the fifth? I don't even remember. It doesn't matter. None of those guys even tried. Doesn't need no one's even tried to. So when I keep hearing these stories, like, oh, what, what, what these new astronauts, like the new space race between China and the United States, it's like, oh, what, what to expect? It's like, you're not going to expect anything because you're scared to death to fake it because you don't know how to fake it well enough with your tech that someone's not, some nerd in, in Nebraska in his underwear at 3 a.m. is going to figure out in two seconds just on a, on a, you know, he's going to turn on his computer for the first time. It's like, oh, that doesn't look right. Right. And he's going to crop it. He's going to fire it off the internet and it's over. It's game over. So no, the the entire space program is has not aged well. It is unfortunate. It is unfortunate because I, you know, retrospect, in fact, in the last year, I've realized that America, when they pulled it off in the 1960s, was the perfect time to do it. And they got away with it. And the whole world believed them. When I talk to people outside this country, outside the United States, well, inside, you know, we're almost required by law to believe in the space program, right? It's like the Americans went to the moon. It was those 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 brave boys you know if you talk to someone you know and you see a single tear roll down their eye and and fall off and turn to a bald eagle and fly away well you, you're not going to be able to get to them but everybody else i say hey you people of sweden why do you think the americans went to the moon right they, everyone says the same thing i don't care what country they say well because it was on the news and your your news would never lie about something like that and I look and I smile and I go, you don't know us at all. Right. If, yeah. If it benefit, if just for anyone that listens to this podcast outside the United States, if it benefits us at all, the media will lie about it. We we are the shine, we are the, the greatest show on earth, right? And that's that's how we marketed ourselves after World War II. And we never stopped, and it's been eroding at the seams, the stage has been falling apart. But we're still pushing forward. No, America, we are the the well the um 
what it, Russia calls us the what the the nation of deception or something along those lines. Uh, you know, the, oh, the empire of lies. That's what they call us. And it's like they're not wrong. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I I, I love the people in this country. I don't love the leadership. <laughs> Again, there's a the line. Because of the carrots that we offer people, the line to get to those people. I mean, yeah, you can yeah. wipe out all of Congress and all the Senate, and there's a whole new crop ready to, you know, willing to replace them. I mean, come yeah, on, it's, look at it's the, definitely a battle. Have you heard of the uh, ancient philosophy of uh, the labyrinth? Refresh my memory. Well, it's just the simple idea of a labyrinth as a philosophical system of control. So remember in the in ancient Greece they had the labyrinth with the Minotaur, the Minotaur. yeah, and the yeah. the brave warrior supposedly trying to you know um, go down there all that stuff. Yeah. But then that they've uh, archaeologists have uncovered massive labyrinth in in Egypt near Aswan, uh, one of those pyramids down there, and it was actually uh, also discovered archaeologically in the in the Bible, the city of Jericho was built as a labyrinth, hmm. and uh, and so it's interesting you have all these. Um, instructions in the Bible, how the, the creator, the almighty is telling, you know, believers telling Israel, uh, he's saying, follow my ways. I will make your paths straight. Oh. Do not turn to the right or to the left. I will make your paths straight. Even if it means him stepping in from time to time to create a miracle like the Red Sea and part, you know, and literally make your path yeah. straight. So it's interesting because the, uh, the ways of the nations all around are, uh, who were enemies of the creator, they employed a system of control that falls in line with the philosophy of the labyrinth, which is you can, you, you, if you escape the labyrinth, you've, you've reached enlightenment. And once you reach enlightenment, um, then you escape the evil spirits that taunt you in the labyrinth. Hmm. But no one technically ever escapes the labyrinth. Right. Kind of like, yeah, don't don't forget how casinos are des deliberately right. designed. Right. You know, people say, "Why is it so hard to get through this place?" Because <laughs> that's how it was designed. You're not supposed to find. You know, the the exits are almost impossible to locate from the center. Almost yeah. impossible. Right. Yeah. So there's there's a uh, uh, there's traces of this that we see all throughout. Um, the, the like the the philosophy of of you know the the God of the Bible is like, hey. It's simple. Tell the truth. Do what's right. God will protect you and fight for you, yeah. and uh, and including revealing the deceptions around you so that your life can be easier to yeah. walk that straight path. Yeah. But the nations around them dealt in deception perpetually, and even to the point of um, I, I have a whole series I'm doing right now called the 42 series where I'm breaking down this historical perspective about the nations and how they interacted with the you know the Israelites and and how the Israelites were swayed over time in different different generations to actually abandon Yahweh and adopt the ways of the nations and start delving in, into this depravity and deception again. And so it's interesting that one of their ideas was something that we still see today. And it was from ancient uh, Chaldea or ancient Babylon, and it was called the Asapu. And you, you might appreciate this if you're a film lover like I am, then you understand like the, the original movie, The Exorcist, mm -hmm. is a modern day depiction of the Asapu from ancient Babylon. And it is, you remember the demon that shows up in the room at the end of the Exodus? Sure. Or the, uh, the Exorcist? Exodus, yeah. Um, I can't remember his name right now, but that's a specific demon that was actually uh, the people that wrote The Exorcist. Like, if you go online and you look at fan groups about that movie, they're actually mad because the writers of the movie twisted the theology by making that, that demon that shows up at the end the bad guy. When in ancient Babylon, it's the good guy who's a, who's a part of the white magic fighting off the evil spirits of black magic hmm. and that the, the guy who carries the case who shows up, he's the Asapu. He's the exorcist slash magician that knows how to take control over the bad black magic spirits and remove them from people's lives by replacing them with the white magic spirits. But the God of the Bible says, whether you want to call them black or white, good or bad, they're all evil spirits there to deceive you. So like you're just, the, this is what Jesus talked about where he says, if you cast out an unclean spirit from somebody that goes to dry and arid places seeking so that he may bring back seven times stronger, he'll bring back seven more demons. And then the, the condition of the man is worse than when he first began. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is where obviously the man who got exercised originally needs to fill himself up with good things and stop doing the bad things so that the door is not left open for seven times worse to come back on him. Right. Yeah. But that's the way they work. 
is that that he was revealing, which was the ancient understanding of the Asapu, he would go in to remove the bad spirit so then he could replace it with the good spirit. Mm. And they held in high esteem these Asapu in their cultures because they were considered magicians as mm. well as exorcists. They even have entire hieroglyphs filling walls full of their rituals and how they did this line by line. And it's literally what Catholic priests engage in today. Hmm. Did not know that. So my love, my heart goes out to everyone that follows Christ and is a part of the Catholic church because you want to know God in genuineness. But unfortunately, the leaders of that particular denomination have strayed from the biblical preachings many hundreds of years ago. Sure. And to the point where now they even claim papal infallibility, which they think that the, the, the Pope can't be wrong. Right. Like his word is gold. His word is bond. So like they've, they've moved far away from putting their faith in the God of the Bible. Yeah. And now they're big proponents, not only of literally George Lemire, the, the, you know, the, the Jesuit priest that, that comes out with this big bang theory in a court to, to, to sure up the Celio model. But now they're, we got the Pope saying he'll baptize aliens if they show up. Right. Right, I remember that, and and to your uh, to your point, I remember you know if I had to pick, people have asked me, it's like, well, who would you put at the top of the authority food chain? You know, at least in terms of men, and uh, I'd say, well, I'd go with the oldest. You know, usually it's the one that's still standing, and that would be the Vatican. People forget, <laughs> it's like, look, the Vatican is yeah. is the is the remnants of the Roman Empire, the one that influenced everything that we still use today, and a lot of stuff. It's like, yeah. They don't have a standing army everywhere and they don't go on huge marches, but they're still around, at least in, in physical, political and, and monetary power. Why do you need a standing army when the leaders and kings of other nations come and kiss your ring? Right. Right. And you've got your own country that's in the middle of, you know, this tiny little country that out. Yeah. And look, they I they do fascinate me in terms of. Uh, you know, the secrets that they keep. I would love to spend, you know, sneak into a, you know, one of their libraries or one of their special things because the stuff that they, they're the, if you had to pick a group that collects all the weird stuff, you know, in a vault, <laughs> yeah. that would, you know, people say, well, you know, like the end of Indiana Jones, which is, wasn't just a movie, you know, where's that big warehouse full of stuff, right? You know, the Americans have, no, the Vatican has a warehouse like that i am sure of it you know that they're constantly you know stuff that they're not going to show the world for various reasons yeah and i it, there's oh man i could i'm gonna have to refrain from going off on that tangent um sure. but I, I wanted to introduce that idea to you because um just to just to show more and more not just on the topic of the shape of creation but also in in the machinations of deceptions that we see the nations employing to to um to keep people not believing in the the truth that we see in in uh, the scriptures yeah. um because what do they tell us with the heliocentric narrative they tell us we're going to suffer a supernova heat death in 200,000 years right so be yeah. afraid now um and by the way we're, we need to get off this rock because we're killing ourselves with global warming or climate change whatever right. buzzword you like so we need to get off this rock which is uh, anxiety in, immediately anxiety inducing as far as like oh yeah. well i sure hope they figured out you know, and of course, take all that tax money, redivert it into things that are not actually being done or discovered or invented. And then you've got theft on top of lies, on top of the idea that there's a boogeyman coming after you. And that's your planet's dying, your galaxy's dying. Oh, yeah. We need to get out of here. It's the evil spirit in the labyrinth, but we don't know how to get out of here right now. It's the same philosophical trap and mental maze that they have us in since birth, telling us this is where you are. It's yep. a dangerous place. This place where you're gonna where you live is gonna is gonna end, as well as all this around us. We've got to get out of here, yep. but we don't know how yet. So trust us, give us your homage, which is your devotion devotee to a god. Yep. And then we'll we'll find the answer for you at some point, I'm sure of it. Yeah. Trust it's, in yeah. Trust in science, which became scientism. Uh, I have never slept so well as when I got into the whole enclosed world, biblical cosmology thing. Never slept yeah. so well because all, I mean, I wasn't that worried about space anyway, because what are you going to do? Right. But I mean, come on, all, you know, gamma ray bursts, you know, black hole meteors every freaking month now. It's like, oh, this meteor yeah. could come within blah, blah, never happens. And then, of course, they've got the, the coincidental, oh, it's a meteor shaped like a jack-o'-lantern and it's next to Halloween. Wow. 
or, or a Christmas or the Christmas meteors or whatever it is. Once you get into this, you realize, oh yeah, there's, there's nothing, nothing's going to get you by the way. And people think, oh, well, no, that, that fear is real. And what, what are meteors and shooting stars? Like, really don't ask that. The question you should ask is with 6 billion smartphones out there, why isn't there a single video of a rock going from sky to ground? Right. Not one. And there's more people have smartphones that have running water now. And I'm not I'm like, what? Nobody next to a beach, nobody on a cruise boat, nobody in a boat. Remember, three, supposedly three out of four should hit the drink because it's right. mostly water out there, right? Don't even have one. I'd love to see a video of an actual meteor hitting the water. Nothing ever hits. It's just lights in the sky that blow up somewhere near the ground. We all have seen those videos, right? Mm -hmm. And that's all you get. What's your theory on that? Oh, what, what do I think meteors are? Yeah. Oh, I think they're just stagecraft. That's all they are. I mean, okay. um, somebody somebody said, you know, the easiest way to do it, he goes, think of like throwing a rock into an aquarium, right? What if, even if it was physical, right? Then all you're, you're using is some sort of high-speed, you know, railgun technology. Biblical railgun technology. <laughs> and you're firing at a shallow angle, let the, uh, the, the nitrogen and oxygen, you know, burn it up before it hits that's that's all you'd really have to do um but the rest of it is again just lights in the sky think of think sorry one more thing really quick St speaking of statistically impossible things uh do you, you remember the movie uh sandra bullock and george clooney gravity oh yeah, yeah. Where, where she was like she fell out of a spacecraft and actually made earth without dying you know over a two-hour movie period yeah what was the whole premise people forget what the premise of that movie was was a satellite knocked into another satellite and then started collecting more satellites and then was just this big wall of jagged metal that eventually ran into the space shuttle right why hasn't that happened yet ever. you gotta remember that yeah. no satellite supposedly has ever hit another satellite year decades and decades of this because you know once it happens it becomes systemic right? Right. once it happens it's, it can't be stopped it's not like you can course correct a damaged satellite if that was real the whole sky should turn into um, uh, the outside of, which I think it was funny, of Wally. You remember the the anime movie Wally, where they punch through it, like, and but all the satellites weren't perfect; they weren't even moving. It's like, no, right. that's supposedly not how it would work. Or, or the again, the the meteor showers that nobody course corrects satellites to avoid. It's like, oh, here's a seasonal meteor shower. It's like, well, shouldn't all the satellites you like have to move, get out of the way? Yeah. Nope never happens you, you know television stations radio state no nobody has no, there are no i've never run into a story about a collision of anything up there where something just went down when when's that people just gloss over it. it's like again it's it's a plot hole kind of like how skynet became alive right in in the terminator movies which was like it's like oh it became self-aware how did it happen yeah, yeah, they can't it doesn't, explain. Doesn't that matter. Part. We're just we're moving on. We're moving on. It's a plot point. It's like yeah, but you're not going to explain. Nope, we're not. <laughs> okay, sure. Well, that's that's actually a great question. Um, what what are your thoughts on stuff like ChatGPT and the oh, supposed it's, artificial it's intelligence? It's, it's all hype. Look, I come from the computer world. I will tell you exactly what it is. Right, this is I'm an authority on this. I will give you the straight dope. Self aware computers are a joke. They're a fantasy. Chat GPT. I rem I'm old enough to remember when AI used to mean self-aware, right? You know, there was a Haley Joel Osment movie directed by Steven Spielberg. It was like, oh, you know, a kid, a robot kid that all of a sudden started asking theological questions on his own. The only way it even happens in movies, right? Three things. Either radioactive goo hits the circuit board, lightning hits the circuit board, or the circuit board is possessed by either an alien or a demon. That's it. That's all you have. You have those three things. That's how they explain it away. That's true. And if they don't, then they do the Skynet, Skynet thing where it's like, well, it just happened. Or or the, the great 70s movie. This is not a new concept, by the way. This is a story going all the way back to um, Colossus, the Forbin Project, which was a 1970 movie. It was like a, a massive computer just became self-aware. How did it happen? Look, computers only do what they're told. They can only do what the code tells them. They can't just break out and go off on a whole different path and then start imagining all this stuff and creating their own robots that want to kill humanity. Doesn't work that way. Chat GPT, well, you saw it. I mean, when Chat GPT came out months and months ago, right? People started hammering with it and they found the flaws immediately and they saw yeah. the reputation. Of, of, okay, all AI is right now, 
it's not going to change anytime soon is it's a collect it's software that can talk to other software it's integrated software packages that you build the interfaces and you can compile things so for the education community oh it's a nightmare so like I, if i was a teacher i would never a professor in a university i would never assign an essay ever again because all you'd have to do like there was a kid uh, in fact I, I knew him it was a freshman in college here in washington state right they got thrown out first semester thrown out of school because she used chat gpt to write a paper why it was too polished you mm. have to be what i said is you have to be literal you have to tell the computer okay write me a paper on this science subject make two percent grammatical errors and throw in exactly four spelling errors right maybe right you have to you have to smudge it up you have to make it look more human but no it's people people write these perfect papers and it's like but no self-aware no no never ever why sorry one more thing is because we can't even come up with a way i can't look i'm i can't even come up with a fictional way that I, I i challenge elon if he's ever listening to this it's like really tell me the flow chart how you even start that process and tell me how many decades it would take the closest you'll ever get and i'm sorry one more thing real quick i'm passionate about this one which is there was a movie um that was about the uh, um cracking the enigma machine the german war machine uh, called um the imitation game with benedict uh, cumberbatch brilliant movie computers by the way were invented by the british in, in during world war ii and then when it was done because he created the very first computer they had to tear them down they marked them as classified and they never gave them to the public so we had to wait decades later until we reinvented them again whatever but he came up with a with his thought was initially he came up with the turing test his name was alan turing which was the test that you give computers like during blade runner and stuff like that you questions you ask computers machines to find out if they're machine or human he goes, the closest we'll ever get is an imitation. Before it was called the Turing test, it was called the imitation game. Because uh, the closest you'll get is a mimic, which is even if you could get all the possible responses of whoever it, whoever it is, right? All the different questions. Even if you could that, they're just parroting you. That's all they're, that's all they're doing. Insight? No. Because we, we can't even explain insight now. It's like defining the human soul, right? It's like, wow. what? define your soul. Okay, then write some code that can, that can actually do that. It's like, no. I think it's uh, I think it's Job twenty nine seven. Speaking of the book of Job, yeah, that says uh, it's the breath of the Almighty that gives understanding to man. There you go. There you so, go. but but when you say can we explain it, you know that's a descriptor. But can you explain how it works? Like on a physics level, man can't do that right now. No. no. Yeah. But as far as like, what if ChatGPT GBT and and other like programs? What if they're just taking all the inputted answers and responses from the users, and then formulating a more uh, adapt and human-like response sure i mean again that's what they're trying to do and can there there's a there's a wonderful british movie um it was the the british version of what uh, uh machina which was but the the british version is called the machine which really should have been called in the first place uh, with toby stevens which was he was asking a computer the Turing test, some Turing test. You know, there's no standard Turing test. You just make it up as you go along. You try to yeah. trip up the computer, usually yeah. asking stuff about emotions and stuff like that because the computer doesn't know what to do with emotions, right? But to your point, they're compiling things, but the human beings have to connect the dots. They've got to create the flow charts to where everything's connected. Yes, it can sound somewhat human in, in text, but that's about as far as it's going to go right it's it's not a, it, it, you might be able to fool the average person with some with some text you know some back and forth with text for a little while until you start asking the tough questions you know stuff about re religion or mm -hmm. emotions or um uh, or even personality preference yeah you know, you'll they'll give you some canned answers but after a while they it will sound canned uh so it, it can only go so far um i don't think it's ever well, between that and, of course, the power problems, which we're never going to solve. By the way, another Terminator thing. People forget how plot holes, the, the huge plot holes in science fiction movies, which was um, uh, the power problem. We will never, people say, oh, we'll have robot servants. It's like, no, you won't, because you'll never solve the power problem. Right. Our battery technology is limited, really, really limited, unless you come up with cold fusion, which is a myth. Or in, and if you could say, oh, we'll just use tiny little reactors. Oh, okay. So you're gonna give people, <laughs> you're gonna give people weaponized things right. that the average person could just take apart and then blow up a city block with it. 
Right. right? Or if it like malfunctions, the, it blows up a house. Well, yeah. That, sorry. One, one more thing along those lines, because I got to point out the plot hole. Terminator 3, which was you saw that he had these two reactors in his chest, right? You know, that that if we're damaged would blow up immensely, right? And it's like, well, that's a problem because one was crushed in the first Terminator by Sarah right. Connor in that press. It's like she would have died and never the factory would have blown up. And it blew up again when he dumped into the molten metal in Terminator 2. But okay, we're just going to go that way a few years later. Ugh. Sorry. No, Bad you're writing. right. There's there's a lot of whole plot holes there. Uh, crazy. Speaking of, I'm so glad you brought up Terminator because that's like part of my research has led me into realizing that automatons have been a thing all throughout history. Did you know that? Sure. Why not? I mean, it's 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 a goal. Any any human beings are lazy. So yeah. yes, I think every civilization. Well, think about it. every device we've ever made um, has been to give us more leisure, right? But this gets really crazy. So when I was researching this, not only did uh, supposedly um, automatons exist, I'm talking I'm much further than Leonardo da Vinci stories, right? Where he supposedly created like for the King of France, he created like a lion or something that sure. kind of walked a little bit, you know. Um, the ancient Indians claim that they actually had an automaton like 3,800 years ago that was literally bodyguard protectors for rulers. Hmm. Like full-on fighting automatons. Um, well, it when it comes and to... And here's the crazy part, though. Go ahead. I, I'm Go sorry ahead. to interrupt you. Here's the crazy That's part. Right. They call them, uh, I think they call them Yonka, Yonka, Yonka Vitra or Yonka Sutra or something like that, hmm. which translates to um, moving spirit. I can see that, like the 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 clay golem type thing, only mechanical. Um, um, yeah, like so they didn't. They even though they had this like metallic copper type of machine that moved, they claimed it was animated by something else. Sure, I could see that. I mean, the the saying is, and I, I've said this for years, which is, there's nothing new under under the sun. We all know that, right? Which yeah. is. Look, our civilization, the, 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 you don't have to watch every season of Ancient Aliens to figure this out, right? Which is, come on, the sunken cities off of Japan are there. The sunken cities off of India, um, Puma Punku, Machu Picchu, uh, Bimini Road, the Bosnian pyramids, the real pyramids, for God's sakes. They're right there. I mean, I went to Egypt just because I heard people that said, if you actually stare, well, well, you know, stand at the bottom of the real pyramids and take a good look and, and stare at this and realize what you're looking at. It's like, and then you turn around and look at Cairo. Oh yeah, they had nothing to do with the building of this thing. <laughs> I mean, this is this is engineering on a whole nother level. And if you have engineering on that level, then what couldn't you do? Meaning the only thing that's stopping us from making robot servants, because Lord knows we want them. We've been, we've been wanting them for a long time. I mean, the Jetsons wasn't just a fantasy. Um, the only thing that's stopping us is the power problem. If we could solve the yeah. power problem, we'd have, I mean, then it would be, um, uh, oh, what was that movie will will smith when it was the robots uh, i robot I, I robot yeah i robot which funny is because i've got a robot i robot sitting over there he vacuums my floor every tuesday and friday <laughs> right yeah it so it's fascinating because uh the same people that claim that they had um like automatons that were sophisticated and guarded important people yeah they also claim to have amanas which flew in the air and oh, the carry... in, oh india i'm sorry india. i thought I, I thought you were talking about native americans briefly. no sorry sorry no. oh no oh india oh my god yes they're, they're not even shy about it no they're um, not uh, no uh, it's in their it's in their history it's even talked about in the modernity by their archaeological professors um that they and they don't claim that it, this is myth like they claim that they had flying craft flying that could hold cities. Yeah. flying cities that hold thousands of people those are called pushpakas yep. the ones that could hold thousands of people and um and so like it, i just I, it makes me wonder like if some of this tech might be reintroduced sure to then escalate uh the absorption of yeah by the way you you we do live in in some sort of reality that's been constructed meticulously what we were wrong we're not just an accident that you know from from goo to the zoo <laughs> yeah. um kind of and, the evolutionary process in fact actually all this was planned and orchestrated by our progenitors and and they're they're back and they all got all this advanced tech and and you should serve them well well there is that i mean there are people that would serve any any of the older civilizations uh, by two two quick things one would be um do i believe that uh, there are official aliens out there um 
yes, there are many different kinds. However, do I think they're from Mars or Jupiter or Venus? No, no, not at all. I just think they're older versions of us, older civilizations um, that produce things. But I do think, and, and I know there's a biblical link to this, but I, I want to stay away for, for one sec, which is I do think that not only are we not the first people to rent this apartment, but there are rules to this place, meaning it's obvious that there aren't big armadas that are coming down and wiping out entire cities on a regular basis, right? You know, that yeah. is one of the running jokes of UFO ufology, which is, okay, if UFOs are real, why haven't they landed in Kansas yet and started taking selfies? And it's like, well, because it appears there's rules. And if anyone has any doubt of that, look up the, the greatest UFO sighting in our civilization wasn't Roswell. It wasn't 1899 Texas. It was um, 1561 Nuremberg. You can look it up. There's a wonderful wiki page on yeah, it. Yeah, it's a wild, wild story about that. Nuremberg, Germany, two giant space armadas just show up on a beautiful April day. Not a cloud in the sky. Just start hammering on each other, right, for an hour. And then a third faction shows up, which was interesting that ancient aliens left out that third faction out of their broadcast, which was weird. Third faction shows up, pulls up in between them. These two take off and the big black, you know, single angular craft, the scary one, you know, eventually just pulls off and leaves. Huge questions there. One, okay, who was the first two that, that uh, were fighting? Who was the third group? Were they the cops? Were they the UN? But the bigger question for me was, what sort of response time are we talking about here? There must have been no, there must have been a dead zone. Because look, I could point a gun out that window right now, fire off a few rounds. There's gonna be cops here in less than 10 minutes. But you're telling me two fully equipped space aircraft carriers can just pound on each other for an hour to where the sketch artist drew the whole thing while eating their toast and schnitz and glubin? No, 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 I'm not buying it. Not not unless there's a dead spot. And so yeah, but the point is, is there's rules. I think those two were not supposed to be there. And the third group was, who were they? Were they the superintendents? Were they the, you know, some of the admins? Whoever they were, they don't buzz by New York on a regular basis or Los Angeles or Paris. So, so I, I'm glad that you, I love all the movie references because, uh, you know, if you ever have the time, if you want to binge something that you might think interesting, yeah. check out my Investigating Babylon and my 42 series because, um, I also love movies and I think there's a lot of predictive programming in movies. Oh yes. Um, and not just predictive programming, but there's also a uh, revelation of the method in movies as yep. well. So, um, Greece, Mesopotamia, ancient India, yep. um, even ancient, um, like Malaysia and other countries, uh, Egypt, the Chaldeans, the Assyrians, all the, all the, uh, all the dominant countries that are, that at one point had some sort of uh, large presence or empire internationally, they all talk about flying machines up sure. to four thousand years ago, yep. and they all talk about how it was their rulers that that basically got to travel in them. It wasn't just the average person, right? right. But specifically, some of them all point back to, and not, not only in their hieroglyphs, but also in their writings, and and they point back to different shapes of vamanas of flying machines. And one of them was the shape of a sphere. And if you, and, and I hope tonight just to, to give you a rabbit trail to investigate, mm -hmm. if you haven't ever thought of it yourself, if you start going back and watching a lot of these movies, there is over and over and over and over again, there's an ominous sphere in a lot of these alien movies, a lot of these mystery movies. Yep. Um, not just the Michael Greitman movie Sphere in 1997. Or, but, um, or Starman. And Starman right. was one, yeah, from the 1980s. Yeah, hundreds, hundreds of of fiction, books, movies, TV. There's a sphere. There's a black sphere. Even in there's a. Um, did you ever see that uh, show? I think it was Netflix or uh, maybe Amazon Prime. It's called The Peripheral. There's a new series yeah. that just came out. Yep. Do, so do you remember in at the end of that series where she's? It's they're mm -hmm. revealing to her, like the the elites are revealing to the young girl like how the sickness came and destroyed like 80% of the world. Right. And it manifests in this hologram as a black sphere. Yeah. It's it. They're standing in that graveyard and she's getting shown all this. Yeah. That's just another small example, but there's tons and tons of examples. So uh, the sphere, according to ancient Egypt was considered the eye of Ra. Ah, nice. That looks down on mankind. Sure. And this is where um, I don't think it's a good thing. <laughs> so 
this is where uh, in in scripture there is a unique passage that talks about in Revelation chapter eight that a a large mountain burning with fire is thrown down from the sky right and kicks off 42 months of chaos right and at the end of that 42 months the messiah returns right. and stops all of it yep so i have this crazy theory really <laughs> of this crazy theory that the manas are real that they're they are used by the controllers the elites and that they they know their time is short and that um the head of them is like what was what was referred to as Mount Maru, what was referred to as as uh, Mount Olympus, what was referred to as the boat of a million years that Ra flew in. Um, it actually is persona is physically embodied as an actual vimana in the shape of a sphere. Hmm. And so I'm I'm just going to tease you with that because if okay. you have a chance, like if you are bored and want to binge binge some things, I go yep. over all this history with great specificity and detail. Uh, both from the scholars and also in the scriptures. And I show all the links and correlations in my Investigating Babylon series and my 42 series. 42 series is ongoing. I'm still adding installments to it. But um, but it also explains some very interesting things within the FE model as well. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Send me send yeah. me whatever you got. I'll uh, I'll definitely take a look. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's just a... It's such a big conversation. You know, it's like it's so many questions I want to ask you, but... But at the same time, um, I'd love to have, have you back on again so we could do like a part two at some point. Sure. You, know? you, you name the time. I will, I'll, I'll be here. But before we go, I just want to ask you, what What do you see? Like, Because you've seen the last almost 10 years now since you put out your Flat Earth Clues videos. Yeah. So we got you know a good, strong nine years of in, in seeing the pushback, seeing people break, like millions and millions of people every day are coming to the truth of where we live. Yeah. And realizing they've been lied to and um and that's not slowing down even no. though you can't see stats on it on you can't google stats on it no um the only thing you can probably see that's a almost a real-time indicator is the you know david weiss's app yeah and the, even that's stunted to a certain degree yeah um i mean we, we get a member even the, the the biggest flat earth channels even after nine years are in the low six figures for subs which is impossible Considering right. what, what we can do and what we influence. I mean, come on, we, we got a flat earth on mentioned on the boys a couple days ago. <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah. In episode and, two, it was like, are you kidding me? It's like really it's well, like there, it was awesome. It's become it's become a common joke, but it's funny that there's some pretty significant influencers that have stopped joking about it and are actually yeah. saying, you know, hey, there's actually some points here that makes me question the narrative yeah. and I, I haven't heard good answers yet. So that's always a good starter place. Yeah. But where do you see this going? So like I mean, we, we've had nine years to experience, at least uh, from our American perspective, and right. we see internationally, we see other people coming to the same conclusions all across the plane of the earth. Yeah. And so where do you see this going? Um, for me, well, I can tell you where I want it to go. Uh, and I think it's I think it's going there. In fact, the only thing that really slowed us down was the was the pandemic. That was it. I mean, in 2019, for example. All the way up to the beginning of 2020, we we could do no wrong. We were bulletproof. We were we were doing conferences in multiple countries. Uh, we were we had endorsements. We had we had all sorts of fun stuff happening. But then the the pandemic shut everything. You know, stunt. You know, to where we couldn't do any international travel. Um, we couldn't even do domestic conferences for the most part, except for Karen B, who started doing them on her own. Um, and grabbing people because we couldn't find venues that would let us do anything without masks. Because as you know, most of the people in our community also don't believe in other things, you know, like masks. Um, but for me, it would be the, um, where I think it's going to go eventually uh, would be some version of the hundredth monkey effect, it, which you may or may not know about, which is, which was a real thing, which science, dis I love it when science discovers something and then denounces their own thing. It's like we didn't come up with this you came up with this which was um the monkey effect which was um you give monkeys potatoes next to some body of water salt water and you know they were testing this in on um, islands next to japan after the war and the monkeys some of the monkeys would wash off the potatoes because they didn't want to eat sand right and then slowly but surely more and more monkeys were watching each other it's like oh yeah that's a great idea but once it, it where it happened was once it hit about the hundredth monkey all the monkeys now and not just that monkeys on that island every island 
they all knew simultaneously, like it like genetically updated all the monkeys, even though they were not physically in contact with each other. And science de denies this. It's like, no, it didn't happen. It's like, really? Because where'd we we didn't pull it out of our butts? Where where did you guys come up with it? So do I think it happens with every species? Yeah, I think it's a beneficial update. So my thought is that eventually there's going to be a tipping point, like with anything, like with peer pressure, which when it becomes less ridiculous to believe in flat earth or in closed world or biblical cosmology, then to go against it, right? When less people laugh at it than the people that nod their heads, it's like, yeah, that's some truth right there. Then, then what happens is I think the, the, the game is up. I think that would be, and again, I'm, I'm making a leap here, but I think that's our, our tower of Babel moment. Where God's like, okay, that's it, <laughs> we're done. You know that, that you know we let, we got to move this thing along, right? And then Act Three comes on, and I'm I'm not saying you know a cataclysm comes. I I'd like to believe in happy endings. I'm really a gl glass half full kind of guy. So, well, if you if you take the Bible seriously, you you would believe in a happy ending. I do, I do believe yeah. in a happy ending, but yeah. I also but I also believe in the hero's journey, which is yeah. again the Bible has all sorts of tragedies and awful things that happen. I mean, tons of them. Well, the, the the hero's journey for Christ, which is the main character of there the, of you the Bible, go, the ultimate hero's journey. Yeah, is going right. to be that he returns and vanquishes the evil dragon. Yeah, and uh, and establishes peace on the earth and teaches all nations how to walk in his in his commandments, there which they stop killing each other as a result. Yeah. So that's where um, the big question comes in is if the Bible tells us that there is a, that this has been the, like the faith of Abraham. Have you ever heard that term, the faith of Abraham? I have. Okay. So like Christ is talking and, and the, to the Pharisees at one point, and he's like, you're not children of God. If you, or, you know, he says, you're not children of Abraham. If you were, you do the deeds of Abraham, right? you know, because they were duplicitous, hypocritical and doing bad stuff. And then, you know, Jesus of course is uh, sent as the son of God to become a resurrected man mm -hmm. which means you had to die first right so there's like that you know which is why he's praying in the garden please if there's any other way let this cup pass for me sure. but uh he endures the cross gets resurrected and he gets appointed as high priest of the covenant and then ministers at the right hand of the creator from from the moment he ascended to heaven until now mm -hmm. so this is the story of the messiah in the bible and this is where a lot of churches leave out the end part they just stop at the cross part like where he died on the cross and that's where right. they stop right they leave out the the end of it which is where not only when he comes back but he comes back with his father's house you know the, the place he said i go to prepare a place for you my father's house or many rooms if right. it were not so when i've told you yeah well that place comes back down as the zion the new jerusalem yeah. and at the end it's also in isaiah and ezekiel but revelation 21 is where most people reference it and it's described as something that's like almost 1500 miles cubed sure that's like most of the United States in in width and length. And then in height also would be 1,500 miles cubed, right. 1,500 miles tall, right. which which if you do in, uh, you know, on our show on Common Ground, Wes Blaze and I show an animation of someone that actually did the, the math and it doesn't fit on a spherical earth. No. It, in oh. fact, it, it would be like, because it's described as a city four square. Right. So like that means you would have like, it sits down in like huge, like 121 miles between the outer edges of it and the curvature of the earth. Right. So basically the nations could not access it. Right. And and it would throw off the tilt and they would fall. Oh yeah, it's it's a disaster. No, no, the physics would not work with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, just like the physics wouldn't work when, uh, and I know we can't go on forever, but um the, the story of joshua you know where he, where he asked god to hold the, the sun of the moon, on the yeah. moon. And it's like you understand how hard that would be if it was a solar system right to right. change right. the physics of that i mean it's like well god's infinite it's like yeah but god's not you know it's more efficient as well it's like look it's way easier just hit pause on the sky like you do on your television than it would be to change everything, including the, all the physics involved in the, you know, the rotation of the earth and the, and the, the earth flying around the solar system and everything else way, yeah. way easier yeah. to do that. So, yeah. And you remember, I told you at the beginning of this, I said, I just started, I just started to trying to be as basic as possible and just defining my terms. Yeah. So when we see stuff like the, the account of the long day in Joshua and you saw you people will like who are defending the, gl the global model they'll say well God can do anything like you said he's infinite he's power he's without sure he's without hindrance so he could do anything but I'm sitting there going so then why couldn't he make a city that's four square and 1500 miles cube there you go 
And they'll be like, well, uh, this it's metaphor. And I'm like, no, no, it's not actually. It's It actually gives you the dimensions, the foundational layers. It tells you specifically that all the nations will visit it and bring their wealth and honor to it. Sure. Like, can you imagine, like you would be able to see it from everywhere under the firmament at 1500 miles tall no yep. matter if you were in australia or on the outer edges in, in Antarctica, you well, would be able to see this thing i, I gotta correct you there you, you don't think so? well you can't well you wouldn't be able to only the, the size yes you absolutely would if it was a vacuum but unfortunately for us because the atmosphere is so thick is that it would distort everything so even less than remember how we see up through the atmosphere I, I know you'd be okay okay so sorry let me clarify you wouldn't be able to see it would get it would it would be a reverse fade so it would be you wouldn't be able to see it at sea level up to a certain point but you'd be able to see the top right. of it it would be right. a, it would be an interesting visual effect because right. yeah it would look in fact it would look like it was still floating depending on the, the atmospheric conditions and, well according to enoch and everything else it actually would be taller uh well that's way taller than the atmosphere itself yes yeah yeah so basically if we can see up and see the sun and moon which is above the atmosphere yeah from our perspective then we'll definitely be able to see the top of it yes you would so, be able to see the top of it so th the point is you'd always have a visual reminder that you do not live in a ball in space yes yeah and well, there, sorry, one, one, one more thing along those lines was um you know uh uh and you'd be able to quote this better than me uh that everyone would be able to see the second coming simultaneously right from everywhere <laughs> right <laughs> That's like what, and and I've had people. I've had, I even had a pastor come at me, and because I I said, well, how's that work in a globe? He goes, well, because they'll ha they'll be watching it on television on the other side of the globe. I'm going, yeah, that's not really the same effect that I it's, think it's God would be going for here. It's, it's like because you're watching it on your phone. Yeah, no, no, yeah. sorry, it's not. It's actually. Um, in addition to that, that, that verse is uh, Revelation 1 7 you're thinking of, but every eye will see him. Um, in addition to that concept, there's even a, a unique passage in Psalm 48 that talks about how the kings of the earth assemble together, which is what you see happening in Revelation 19. Uh, the kings of the earth assemble together, but they saw the city of God and they fled in terror. Yeah, why wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, if, if, come on, we've never built anything like that. That reminds right. me real quick of um, why a lot of people don't know why the Native Native Americans finally surrendered, where they took some of their leaders and they took them to Washington, D.C. after Washington, D.C. was pretty much built. And it struck him with such awe as far as the engineering goes, right? Because the Native Americans didn't have engineering skills. And it's like, if they can build this, we have no chance at all. And that was it. That that was like he went back. It's like no, we're 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 packing this one in. So imagine us that could see, yeah, uh, any any sort of floating structure that was way. I mean, not just not just beyond our engineering capability, but octave right. above our engineering capability. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're talking a continent coming down. And this is what Hebrews eleven talks about. It says that Abraham, he uh, believed in a heavenly country whose architect and builder was God. Yeah. Um, that's reserved in heaven, as First Peter one talks about. Um, that's waiting to come down. And this is where the average person has no clue that the Bible teaches this. This is why this is why we made it our mission. We call ourselves Kingdom in Context because I, I growing up in church, I started to realize they're just talking about the cross. Which don't get me wrong, that's obviously important. We 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 love and we praise Christ for his sacrifice to do what God sent him to do. Right. But that's not the entire book. That's not the end of the story. The end of the story is that God's house, which is massive, literally comes down through the firmament. Yeah. So, like, if I believe in this Bible and and that it can be life changing to, to for people to know this knowledge and put their faith in the creator and his son, then, then I want to share all the details with them, right? Yeah. Because in doing so, it actually breaks through so many other lives yeah. that are keeping them subjugated currently. Oh, the so, imagine, imagine the humility, the, the, the massive wave of humility that would, would wash over people. They'd, they'd be like, I mean, every other conflict in your life becomes trivialized. Yes. Almost, almost instantly. I mean, not, not eliminated entirely, but it's like, uh, yeah, you, you, you don't have any, whatever your passions were, uh, have now been completely sidetracked. And, well, free will kind of goes out the window at that point because now you're worried. You, you, I want to encourage you. You still got free will. Oh, it I'm actually, sure. I'm it talks, sure. It talks oh, about that in uh, Zechariah 14 and other places that there will be nations that refuse to come to uh, the New Jerusalem to observe the feasts of God. And their punishment is that they get no rain on their land. Let me, I, let me, I know, I, let me end with this. I, there, there, that reminds me of something, again, you know, part of this, which was, um, uh, 
the the movie you know fu- uh, the the film uh, funny thing happened on the way to the moon where mm-hmm. they were asking um, bart sabrell was asking the astronauts to put their hand on the bible right yeah and i took a different meaning than bart did on this because i understood which was there there's deny there's denial and then there's knowing committing a crime committing an act when you know for sure that it's wrong and because the astronauts it's like what are you talking about they wouldn't put their hand on bible it's, it's called perjury people do it all the time right and people it's not a new thing why wouldn't they just put their hand on the bible it's like oh, i went to the moon it's because for them they know i think with the apollo astronauts especially they were privy to okay this is what the world looks like this is why you can't tell anybody and then in the back of their head it's like oh the, then then god is real <laughs> that that everything that everything that you know everything biblical is real and therefore can you i think there's different rules meaning you can't lie it's a whole different set of fear if you lie it's one thing to lie if you think somebody's what you know a higher power is watching you it's a whole other thing knowing someone is watching you and i think for them it really struck a chord it's like yeah because remember they they didn't just say no they walked away from that bible like it was like it was radioactive they, they, they wouldn't get near this thing it's like wow that's that really must be something for them but then again it kind of wrecked them in the end anyway just some occurred to me <laughs> that's that is a horrible pun it wrecked them in the end oh sorry about that um i mean that so, but you this is fun to to leave off on a, on a fun note here because you're absolutely right brother everything you're saying uh, as far as be, when you're faced with truth to, to a degree where you can't run away from it, huh. um, lying is not an option. And that's, no. and I'm pulling up here since we started with the book of Enoch, I had no clue we we're going to talk about the book of Enoch tonight. So you actually, you actually made my night, um, oh, good. but it's a very interesting thing here because I'm let me find this passage real quick. It talks sure. about the Kings of the earth. Um, when they have to uh, face the Son of Man, which is the Messiah, when he returns and they have to be judged. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can find this quick passage for you. All right. While you're doing that, I, I want to mention to people, because of that, because of the, uh, and I, I actually, when I got into the whole enclosed world, Flat Earth Theory, when I realized what this place was and what it was built, my morality changed to where I will never do anything malicious to anyone ever again gun to my head won't do it because now i know what the what the cost of that is yeah um and beforehand you know look i used to do some occasional bad thing but maliciously i I don't care if someone said hey you know i will never do anything in mean spirit to someone now accidentally that's one thing but i i won't deliberately do it anymore it's because what you're describing is called repentance by the way (laughs) and uh and it's uh it's actually a cool thing because uh the, the creator says i can't remember exactly what passage this is but he says uh, the eyes of the lord uh roam the earth seeking whom he may bless is should he find someone that's doing what's right hmm. so i gave you the modern english translation but that's well, essentially you. what it says okay. enoch 62 you were talking about people that won't be able to lie anymore right enoch 62 verse 3 and there shall stand up in that day all the kings and the mighty and the exalted and those who hold the earth and they shall see and recognize how he that's the messiah sits on the throne of his glory and in righteousness is a judge before them and no line word is spoken before him hmm. yeah. yeah so this yeah. is what we see in matthew 25 as well is where he sits on his throne um, in the new jerusalem and all nations are brought before him to, to be judged so this is why it's called judgment day you know um it's not t2 obviously it's not it's not <laughs> yeah. fire and death it's actually it's actually good it's actually the messiah is removing the wicked and the people that are murderous right and that want to kill you with fire and death with with h bombs uh, if you even believe in those but they want to remove those people and he he wants to install good people who do what's right and this is what's called the sheep and goats judgment the sheep are allowed to live because he sees their heart they want to do what's right he just needs to teach them how to actually do that properly and so this is why you know doomsday is only doom for for wicked people yeah 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 so that's the that's the encouraged message we want to leave with you guys right. although we talked with about lots of conspiracies tonight and uh lots of things that are not conspiracies because they can and are being proven actively every day um so just keep that in mind and uh and we don't know what the future is going to hold as far as where this conversation internationally is even going to go 
and how they're going to try to stop it in the future. But they have been trying to stop it. But if they can't, it's still growing. People are still talking about it relentlessly um, because it forces you to realize you were created. Atheism is a lie. Evolution is a lie. Um, you do have a creator that loves you and cares about you. And that is uh, hopefully the takeaway. If you're watching this and it's your first time at Kingdom of Context, um, we highly encourage you to seek out the scriptures and put your faith in the creator. Wonderful. So, Mark, you're you're awesome, brother. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I've met you in person. I don't care what they say about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, I know. Look, look I until know. you show me something differently, I'm only going to believe the best about you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's the way we should all be, in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, brother, I really appreciate you. And um, and in the future, hey, uh, their lighthouse is live, and they're they're working out some kinks, and it's growing every day. And so, um, if you haven't taken a look at it, go to take a look at it. Okay, so I will. It's uh, it's awesome, guys. Cool. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the super chats. Uh, looks like someone. Oh, someone dropped a flamethrower. Nice. Thank you so much for that, Aaron. I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Andrew, for the super chat, and um, or for the light sticker, I should say. And we'll be announcing this winner of this gift card tomorrow. So, happy Father's Day to everyone out there. And uh, Mark, we'll see you again. Is there anything else to say before you go? Any any events or things you want to talk about? Uh, just real quick, you know, anyone's been listening, take whatever I say with a grain of salt. I'm not here to convince you or persuade you. In the end, you have to do your own research. Always ask questions. Figure it out for yourself, and eventually, you will get to the truth. There it is. Have a good night, everybody. We appreciate you. We'll see you next time.